Dear Heavenly Father, we praise your holy name, Lord God. We thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, Father. Father, we praise you. We thank you for choosing us before the foundations of the earth for a time such as this. We thank you, Father God, for touching each and every one of our lives and turning us around in the direction of holiness and righteousness to be walking the narrow path. We praise you, Father, for talking to us, for we will hear in in, in our ear a voice behind us saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the left hand or whenever you turn to the right, Isaiah 30, 21. Father, we just praise you and we thank you for the the, the period that we're going through, the month of Av, which is a month of testing, the month of Alul, uh, which we are just now uh, just coming to the end of Father God, which is a month of uh, uh, blessings and, and, and a month of uh, great repentance before your throne, Father. And now we're entering into 5778, and there are even those people out there, Father, that uh, have identified the number 8 in 5778 as a time of blessings for your saints. Father God, they're, they're, you know it's very difficult for so many of us to understand because two things are always happening at one time. Many of us are just focused, Father. Many of us, our hearts are just focused on departure. Many of us, our hearts are just focused on perhaps the harvest and the dark times coming upon the earth because we look at it as an opportunity for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon our lives, and we want to bring in that final harvest. We need the shaking of the earth to be able to wake up the people. And, Father, we need your help in order to do that. Not that we cannot live that life, not that we cannot wear a Jesus shirt, not that we can't touch people with our testimonies or or go to old folks' homes and read the Bible to them and just, you know, share the love of the Lord Jesus, Father. But it helps us so much to be able to spread and help and touch people through uh, social media outlets and things like that. Father, we just need your touch. But, Father, at the same time, you know, we know that these both things are coming together. We see a crescendo of events. We don't forget that there was a blood moon, biblical blood moon tetrad in September 20, uh, 23rd of 2015. We don't forget that the, that the United States was sliced in half. We realized uh, with, 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 a, with, a great, with a great eclipse, Father. We praise you for that. We thank you for these signs in the sun and the moon and stars. We praise you, Father God, although there are people out there that are beginning to contest the legitimate uh, nature or how legitimate the uh, sign of the woman in the stars for September 23rd of this month is this Saturday. There are people saying, you know, there are new people that are coming out and, you know, supposedly people that are astronomers, father, that are saying that maybe that, that, you know, maybe the claims are not exactly accurate. Father, we don't know. All we know is that you have historically given us tons and tons of signs going back for most of us, I would say the big ones, Father, have been all the way back to 2011. And we've seen the crescendo, and then there was a waxing and a waning and a waxing and a waning, and it, and it crescendoed up, and then it ticked back, and then it crescendoed up, and it ticked back, Father. And we believe, many of us believe, and we thank you for that, Father, that these crescendos, this ratcheting up of, of, of apocalyptic shakings of the earth, uh, 7.1 earthquake, 8-plus eight, eight uh, earthquake scenarios, Father God, uh, uh, incredible soon, uh, uh, strange receding's of the uh, uh, waterways along the ocean fronts, Father, in different parts of the world that have never been seen before a volcanic activity that is nothing less than record setting an uptick in 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 earthquakes father the animal kills have not subsided not even in the slightest little bit the the thing the the babble and the and the and the banter going back and forth about global warming has has been absolutely fruitless yet there is endless empirical evidence father of of incredible catastrophic climate change occurring all over the world. Maybe not warming, maybe not freezing, maybe all of the above. Hallelujah. And we praise you, Father, for that. The chemtrails continue. The manipulation of the weather systems appears to be continuing. Father God, we we see very little uh, drop off on the apocalyptic warning signs. Father, there's been an increase in the in the sky trumpets, the strange sh- sounds across the earth, the, the a continued increase in bizarre behaviors uh, that we've been collecting on this program. In the, in the, as in the days of Noah section. Father, we see these things and we're, kind of, we're tracking them like hawks. We're watching them, Father God, but we're trying to stay Nepho. We're trying to stay sto- uh, sober and, and, and level-headed as we watch these things occur around us. We see them. 
and we praise you. Father, thank you. We thank you. We thank you over and over again for continuing to, to, to keep a steady pace of the warning signs that we need to be able to continue to warn people around us, to continue to awaken people. We continue to get, Father, we praise you for the emails that we get from people uh, and the communications that we get from v- various sources from people that that their that their spouses and brothers and sisters are being awakened from one uh, uh, input or another uh, source. Father, we just thank you for this. We praise you because we know that ultimately you're raising up the largest possible remnant bride of harvesters that could that you could that, could, that you could have because we need as many harvesters as we possibly can have in order to be able to bring in that final harvest and glorify our Lord Jesus Christ that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Hallelujah. John 14, 12. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for the uptick in Obama prophecies and the confirmations from some prophetic sources that many of us have been tracking for years uh, that, that, uh, that are confirming and, and continuing to confirm from multiple sources, Father that Obama is a major, if not the uh, uh, quintessential timeline element of the end times and possibly the Antichrist. Not one of them, but the Antichrist. Uh, A a host body about to have uh, the incarnation of Satan himself overtake his body. Uh, The man of sin. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus, for these warnings. We praise you, Father, for the warnings uh, uh, that, that all seem to be clearly pointing to Obama going back, oh my, uh, all the way into the 1700s, the 1800s, with clear uh, prophecies calling out a son of Kenya uh, as, as, early in the 20, uh, in, as early in the 20th century as uh, 1918, the son of Kenya, a Walu prophecy, Father God. We praise you for that. We thank you, Father, for the tons and tons of confirmations that we've received lately. We praise you, Father, for keeping us on the edge of our seats. We thank you, Father, for the steadfast, continuous flow of warning prophecies of imminent judgment. And we praise you, Father, for keeping us uh, watchful and ready, drawing ever closer to you. We are living in a time of continuous change. We realize, Father, that your, your economy of time is not our economy of time. And we lift up our hands before thee. We bow our heads before thee. And we praise you, Father God, and we declare in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, your will be done. In Jesus' name, Father God, Your will be done, Father, we pray, and we thank you for the blessings that you have blessed your saints, those of us who have had our heads down, seeking you in repentance, seeking you in holiness and righteousness for so many years. It has been a very, very difficult walk, and if we have more years ahead of us, Father, we can expect it to be nothing less than infinitely even more difficult than it has been thus far. And we thank you, Father, for ratcheting up these things slow enough that we have time to set aside to become closer to you, time to allow you to bless those of us who have had our heads down with a humble and contrite spirit before your throne, praying for change in our lives, to bring us closer, to get help and helpers in our lives and to change our ministries, to change the things, to increase the numbers, to touch people and to awaken them, Father. We praise you for rising up those of your people, Father, who you have chosen for a time such as this, those who you have ordained, John 15, 16, for a time such as this. And, Father, at the same time, we pray for those who have slipped off into a state of complacency. Father, no matter how long it takes, no matter how long it takes, we beseech thee, Lord God, to awaken the people in the church, to awaken more and more people in the church. We know, Father God, from, from the parables, from Matthew 22 and other parables in the Scripture and other Scriptures, Father, Lord Jesus spoke when he was on the earth, and more, uh, that, that the time that we are in right now is a time, indeed, of the Laodicean church, a time, indeed, of those who are listening with itchy ears that don't want to hear sound doctrine. They don't want to hear any of the bad stuff. They don't want to hear that it's a narrow gate. They don't want to see that the penalty of, of continuous and habitual sin is death. And, Father, we just pray in the name of Jesus that you will continue to awaken them and can continue to open the microphones of more and more and more people because we know that, pe- that, that Father, that people don't all dance to the same voice. They don't all respond to the same pastors and the same style of teaching. And we ask you, Lord God, not only to shake this earth and continue to ramp up, ratchet up, p- 
push the lever, the big red lever, the throttle, if you will, of the apocalyptic A320 Airbus throttle lever, Father God, continue to ramp it up so that we have more fodder, a more cannon fodder to be able to awaken the people, Father, in Jesus' name, and to touch their lives, to awaken them with more people, more voices. Uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you for an anointing to come down upon your people across this world, that we will awaken a great, a great army of spiritual warfare, people that are just enabled with the, the, the endowment of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. Keep us close. Keep us, keep us humble. Keep us contrite. Keep us strengthened, Father God. Make the changes that are necessary in each of our lives, in each of our walks, to bring us to the place that you need to bring us, that we are able to be as fruitful as we possibly can for the days ahead. We thank you for the, term, the, the turmoil occurring in the Middle East. We thank you for the turmoil occurring in, in North Korea. We thank you for the turmoil and the warnings coming out of the in Israeli Defense Forces in regard to the, 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 the activity in Syria and the buildup of the armies in that part of the world. We praise you, Father God, for keeping us on the edge of our seats. And we thank you, Jesus, for you are our awesome advocate who suffered but also experience temptation, many of the same temptations that we are experiencing even today in our lives. And we praise you for every moment of prayer that you spend on our behalf before our Father. For without you, Lord, we would all be lost. We thank you for your compassion and love for each of us as we strive to please you and serve you. We love you, Lord. We love you, Father with all of our hearts and we will lay our lives down to bring one more person to the foot of the cross. We praise your holy name. And now to him, Lord Jesus, who is able to keep us from stumbling and present us faultless, faultless before your holy, holy presence, Father God, with exceeding joy. And to you, Father, who alone is wise, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Father, one more thing, please. I pray for a spirit of peace, shalom, to come down on the, our fellow brothers and sisters as we pass through this weekend. So many, so many hearts will be broken. And many, many, many of us, thousands, have had our hearts broken in that same exact way before. And we know how agonizing that is. And we ask you, Lord God, to bless, to deeply, deeply bless and love upon every one of our fellow brothers and sisters and to pour out a spirit of peace, peace which passes all understanding upon the hearts and the minds of every single person that is anxiously awaiting the transformation of their bodies to stand in the presence of our awesome Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I know you have a heart for them. And Jesus, we know you have a heart for us. Those of us who so long to leave and to be in your presence. It's a very, very hard, hard time to be alive. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It's full of blessings, but it's full of challenges. It's, uh, it's for me, it has been full of sleepless nights. Um, you know, I'm just... Wearing my heart out on my sleeve, we we go through uh, this roller coaster. Some of us are tend to be real stable. We're just very stable-minded individuals. Uh, uh, some of us are, you know, uh, more roller coastery. Uh, some of us love. I mean, we may not admit it. Praise Jesus. We may not admit it, but we, without knowing it, we unwittingly embrace the roller coaster ride because to us it just gives us these peaks of hope to escape 
the doldrums of or the suffering that we may be going through in our individual lives. Some of us suffer more greatly from rejection than others do. Some of us are kind of hardened. I don't mean necessarily a hardened heart per se, but we just don't take it as personally as others do. This is something I totally relate to myself. I am one of those people who do not take personal rebuke and snarkiness and meanness directed directly at me, especially in person and and over emails, which to me is in person. Um, I don't take it well. I don't take it well. I wish I was a little more less empathetic. I wish I didn't feel the feelings as well, less sensitive perhaps. And you learn over time to become like a Timex watch and take a beating and keep on ticking. There's going to be a lot of uh, tongue lashings that are handed out uh, probably Saturday night, Sunday morning. Uh, For those of you who are fans of Facebook, Twitter, uh, especially Facebook, you're going to see a lot of lot of that going on. A lot of I told you shows. Uh, yeah, I can't. Yeah, I told you shows. Right, that's great. I told you shows. There's going to be a lot of that, which God hates. Boy, just watch it. It's heartbreaking for me. I, that's one of the reasons I, I have a lot of people. I love them. I love them. Some of them are very close ministry friends of mine that say things like, you know, uh, I love Facebook. I I'm all about Facebook. I do my whole ministry on Facebook. I, for one, I, I, it doesn't, it breaks my heart. I have too much empathy. I can't see people who profess to be Christians putting nails in their own coffins. Post after post after post after post, disparaging fellow brothers and sisters, judging them, speaking negatively, which there are dozens of scriptures and entire sections of the Bible that rebuke us and warn us of hellfire for such behavior, yet they do it. And they think they are doing God a service, John 16, 2. But they're not. They're sending themselves to hell is what they're doing. And that breaks my heart because I cannot think of anybody. I can't stand to think of anybody. I can't even listen to hell testimonies anymore. I want to get a whole bunch of people that have been taken to heaven on this radio show because I think we all need to hear more of that. I think that's real, real important. We need, and so uh, this is a shout-out to Sister Nancy. This is also a shout-out to all uh, uh, all of you uh, out there that are regular listeners of the program and even the, the non-regular listeners, um, I, I cannot more emotionally reach out to you and beseech you on behalf of the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ to make a note of my email. It's jbaptist777 at gmail.com. Now, my name's John Seitzinger, but jbaptist777, Johnny Baptist is my radio show name. It was my moniker or my uh, uh, my nom de plume for the writing of over 420 articles on tribulation-now.org, tribulationnow.com, one word. But... And it's a fun, it's a fun name, and people can remember it. So it's easy for the email. It's just J Baptist seven 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 three sevens. You know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit seven seven seven. God's favorite number. It's pretty cool, easy to remember. J Baptist seven 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 at gmail dot com. If you know somebody that's out there, showed up on Sid Roth, has a YouTube video, has been taken to heaven, or just somebody that you think would be a, make a really great guest for the program. We have to bide our time. We have to bide our time along with our Father. We have to continue to be. I'm not talking about just this ministry. I'm talking about every ministry that's out there. All of us. uh, You know, imagine even the heartbroken ministries out there. How must it feel to be like some of the people that we brought on the radio show? And I'm I'm not going to name names. I love them. I don't want to. You know, I don't want to call out their names. You know, just before we go past a big date. But but. We, I love them, and I mean, I love them. I, I, the, the, there's just words cannot describe how intimately I feel in love for people who hunger and thirst to the point of tears, where they have obsessed 
and studied and researched and buried their heads in the scripture looking for that that golden moment that we could be taken off this earth that, that we're in the same place that I was at one time uh, I just had sister Terry Hill uh, she's going to be joining us I think on the first uh, the first uh, uh, Sunday in October and I just got a, a communication from Sister Terry Hill. She's been doing some digging around, and evidently, now she she's very cautious because she's wise and she's been doing this a long time. And um and uh, and uh, she but she found an article that was very compelling. And if it's compelling Sister Terry Hill, it's compelling me. Uh, and it talks about uh, multiple phases of the harvest. It even, it even mentions in the Luke twelve verses thirty. 6, 37, 38, you know, second and third watch. If I come in a second watch, blessed is he. If I come in a third watch, blessed is he. It's a mystery. What does that mean? Is there a barley harvest? When does it occur? You know, what are the different phases? We The multi-phased rescue mission concept is something I've re- I wrote an article on that all the way back in 2011. How many years ago is that? Holy moly. Praise Jesus. So it's very exciting to be alive right now. I know I say that a lot. And it's also, it's Ecclesiastes 118 all the way. You know, uh, he who has, you know, great wisdom has great sorrow. I'm just totally paraphrasing it. The more we learn, the more sorrowful we can get. And then... We have the metaphors of running the race that Paul was so awesome about using over and over again. The two metaphors that I I just love the Apostle Paul using is prisoner of Christ and running the race. And I just assume that the people, you know, if I was talking to a bunch of people that were milk drinkers, but you know what? If, If you want to know where the milk drinkers are at, look for huge numbers. Look for huge numbers, and if they're all a lot of you know thousands, 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 thousands thousands of Christians, you know, guess what? You found the milk drinkers. (laughs) Look at your Bible. Look what it says. I always estimate that the people that are regular listeners of this program are part of the bride of Jesus Christ. They aspire to be part of the bride of Jesus Christ. They fear God, and they are perpetually humble, contrite, hopeful but wise enough to also know that things don't always go the way we hope. And that they are routinely buried in the Bible, reading and learning and searching for mysteries and excited about the the mysteries of the universe and the mysteries of, of, uh, you know, uh, the fallen angels and all the things that we expect to be happening. You know, I'm I'm not, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to be like, you know, going wahoo, you know, running around and, you know, I'm not going to be one of those weird, you know, weird folks that you see on those movies, you know, like contact with Jodie Foster out, you know, throwing a picnic in a barbecue, uh, waiting for the aliens to come to earth because they're going to save us and take us away on their Merkaba light ships, uh, you know, but at the same time, what a powerful witnessing tool. And we have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of warnings that they're on their way. I mean, I know some of them are here and all that kind of stuff, but I mean, on force. And I think it's a lot bigger. You know, if you take any one of the guests that we brought on this program that have, you know, shared with us their book about what they think about, you know, otherworldly beings and how they map back to the Bible. Take your pick. Take your pick. It doesn't matter. As a matter of fact, the closest one of all of the uh, people that we've been absolutely gushingly blessed by having on this program, 1,030-some shows, hallelujah, praise you, Jesus. Oh, my gosh. Um, it, you know, the one that I probably come the close, closest to agreeing with wholeheartedly is John W. Myler with his book, Aliens and the Antichrist. I think he nailed it. I don't think he realizes how absolutely anointed he was. And he wasn't even a reader of books like the Dulcie book and and the Bruce Allen Walton papers that leaked out of Dulcie and the different underground bases. John W. Myler just searched, flipped through the Bible, searched through it, prayed, sought God, and God revealed things that could only have been given to somebody via testimony like Pastor Howard Storm sitting in front of Jesus Christ and finding out about life in the universe right from Jesus' mouth. But most of the people that we brought on the show haven't heard of these people before. 
But that's okay because we know that God uses us all and gives each one of us a piece of the puzzle. Of course, a lot of us believe when we write our books or whatever that God has given us the piece, right? But that's okay. We can't help it. We all want to believe with all of our heart that when we're hearing from God, we're hearing with laser accuracy and acuity. Don't you? I do. I scare the dickens out of myself on a regular basis because I, I beat up on myself. I make mistakes. I sin occasionally. Sometimes I make big ones. And I'm fearful of God, and I'm crying out sometimes for days. I call my sister, please pray for me, please pray for me. And she's like, Johnny, you might not forgive yourself, but God forgives you. Oh, yeah. I suffer, believe me, folks. I preach holiness and righteousness because I know how fragile this walk is. And I want every one of us to make it as part of the bride of Jesus Christ. Everyone, even you out there that don't even right now know what I'm talking about, I want you to learn who the remnant bride of Jesus Christ is and how special she is in all of the universes and what an incredible reward that is to be found worthy of that calling and to strive for it. Praise his holy name. And I admit there are some times that I just... Hallelujah. Sometimes I get worn down. I've heard this from other saints, too. And they would say, I just want a little cabin, a little cabin in the woods with my, you know, with some bears and rabbits, you know, little bunnies outside and, and Jesus visiting me on occasion. I'll be happy with that. We all get worn down. We all get worn down. We all struggle. We all have bowling balls thrown in, or uh, uh, watermelons from the devil thrown in, buffeting from the devil. Temptations thrown before us that are irresistible, that we don't, you know, and then it's just part of the walk. It's part of the walk. Practicing righteousness means you goof up once in a while. But you do not let it discourage you. That's the problem that I have. I get discouraged when I mess up. And then it takes me days of repenting and crying before God and seeking counseling from other, you know, uh, saints and, and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But eventually God sends me a blessing. God sends me something to let me know it's okay. It's not okay that I sinned. It's okay that I dorked up, he accepts my repentance. First John 1, 9 becomes my reality. If we confess of our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you don't carry that around as a badge of honor. You carry that around as a tearful, merciful understanding of the depth of God's grace and the awesomeness of our Lord Jesus Christ and his temptations on this earth, knowing all the things that we had to suffer and have to suffer even today in our walks, and being our personal advocates before the Father. Sometimes it takes us goofing up, making mistakes, having true godly sorrow, and seeking the mercy of our Father, for us to draw closer and closer and closer to Jesus, knowing in our heart that if it wasn't for Him. See, it's when we think we've got it figured out, when we think we're not slipping, that's when we enter the danger zone. And I know so many people that have what appear to be very anointed ministries that speak with such authority about how they've got it together. And I worry sometimes for them. We all need to remember that there's a very fine line. 
It's, it, it, there's this place where we must always believe and know that we cannot possibly... Look, if Isaiah, come on, please, if Isaiah stood before God and said, I am undone, and a cherubim had to bring a coal down and touch it on his lips to purify him, we just don't realize, we don't realize. We are never, ever righteous. It is the blood of Jesus. It is his, his continuous uh, 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 um, advocacy on our behalf before the Father. Even when we think we're doing good, we're in sin by virtue of believing we're doing good. If anyone, look, at the Scripture even says, that which is not from faith is sin. There's another one that's very convicting. Uh, if, 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 uh, if, if anyone knows to do good and does not do it, to him, it is a sin. Oh, but I'm discerning, you see. I'm discerning. I'm, I'm being a good steward. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm deciding when it, whether or not I'm going to do that good thing or not. Well, Scripture seems to be pretty clear. If you knew to do the good thing and you did not do it, to you, it is a sin. The implication there is almost that because you're walking in the Spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ is imbued in your spirit, that the very idea that you saw the opportunity to do good was the Lord Jesus Christ and His compassion through your spirit made manifest. And your unwillingness to act upon that is an act of spiritual disobedience. But yet we go through our lives thinking that we're doing a pretty good job. And I think that might sometimes be actually the more dangerous place to be in our walk. And I praise God every time I dork something up. Every time I fall to my knees and bawl my eyes out. Because on the backside of that recovery... I feel closer to the Father and so in love with Jesus Christ, so in love with Jesus, because I know, I know he forgave me. I know he did. And then there comes the sign. Then there comes that email at the perfect time when you're feeling your worst, when you're feeling the, you just feel like you let God down. And then something happens and you're like, oh, Father. Thank you so much. We all need that touch because the walk is a difficult walk. Narrow is the path. Difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few that shall find it. And in the name of Jesus, I pray that every past, present, and future listener of this radio show feels the agony of the difficulty of that walk. Because if you don't, you might need to examine yourself a little bit more closely. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Keep us all on that narrow path. Keep us all excited about the things that we see around the world, but also, Father, place a spirit upon each of our hearts to recognize the blessing that you have given us each in our families, our spouses, our loved ones, our children, let us not become so apocalyptic in our hearts that we neglect the love and the blessings that you have laid before us in our lives that we should ignore them because we're so busy watching for the next earthquake like I was for so many years. Thank you, Father, for your blessings. Thank you, Father, for your blessings. Thank you, Father, for your blessings. Help us all to receive those blessings, Father, because we know that you will bless us eternally, even on this earth, even as the darkness rises, and we receive those blessings, and we praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Glory be to you, Father God. Praise you, Lord. Brother Jose, are you there? Oh, praise Jesus, Johnny. That, that, you know, that's just beautiful. Johnny, I have, I have a story to tell um, to you and, and the listeners, and it's a story of hope. You know, God says that as, 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 as followers of Christ, 
that our duty, our main commandments is to love that God with all heart, mind, and soul, and love thy neighbor as, as yourself. And one of the verses that, man, it scares me, it really does. When I read it, I get a little shivers. Is Matthew 5.22. And it says, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, raka, which means stupid or slow-minded, slow-minded, will be subject to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says you fool will be subject to the fire of hell. In other words, if you go to somebody and you're angry with them and you call them a fool, you idiot, guess what? You're going to be subject to hell. That's how much God loves his children. He doesn't want any one of his children to be verbally abused. That's how hard the bar is. So let me tell you a little story about what happened to me. I got a phone call, and I had to meet with somebody that had hurt me a lot and had made my life miserable. I mean, as soon as I got the call and, 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 and I had to meet him, there was no way to get away with I just got shivers, man. I mean, I was like, oh, man, I, you know, I do not want to meet with this person, but I kind of had to, couldn't get out of it. And all of a sudden, I, I started having in my heart this feeling of like, anger and unsettledness and and I was a little bit of bitter and I'm looking at myself and I'm like man I don't, I'm kind of not liking this but at the same time the memories of the pain start coming back of how I was you know ill treated by this person and so you know I'm I'm looking at this and I'm like oh man that person that person is evil that person is wicked that person hurt me man I can't believe that person did it to me I was mad I began to get angry all of a sudden, I started thinking, you know, that, that maybe I had to say something about the mistreatment, you know. Hey, man, you, you didn't done these things to me and complain. And my heart is sinking a little bit and sinking a little bit. And I get there. And all of a sudden, I see this person. I see them face to face. And instantly, I mean, instantly, my heart turned to love for this person. It was actually a very strange sensation because like 30 seconds ago, I had a heart full of fear and a heart full of anger and a little bit of the root of bitterness. And instantly I see this person and all of a sudden I'm filled with love for this and compassion. And I kind of feel bad for them. They're so lost and they don't really know what they're doing. And, and I look at them and say, man, this father, you know, this is your children. You love them too. And I'm a, I have to be a conduit of love. I have to, you know, get all this stuff away, pulled away, and install a new heart in me and love this person. And, and, and the conversation went actually really well. And all throughout the conversation with this person that had hurt me, all I had was love and affection and compassion for this person. The meeting, you know, I treat him well. I treat him with love and respect and kindness. Uh, the meeting with this person ended. And all of a sudden, to be honest with you, I was a little rattled because I, I, I didn't know what happened. How, how can my heart change from one minute to the other? And as I'm in the car and I'm, I'm meditating on this and kind of praying about it, the Holy, the Holy Spirit, God reminded me that I pray for a new heart. And, and, and I say, Father, you know, in the name of Jesus, give me a new heart for your people. Give me a new heart. Make me love and kindness. Instill this this beautiful heart in me because I want to be love and I want to be kindness. I want to share your word. I want to be like Jesus, Father. And for that, I need a new heart. And Father, please give me a new heart. And the Lord reminded me that that had been my prayer. And so the incredible thing is that this walk, what is asked of us is hard. It is truly hard. But the hope, the great hope that we have is that we don't have to do it alone. It is not 100% up to us. We have to do the work of wanting to change, and we have to do the best we can. But we also get help from the helper, the Holy Spirit. And so I was reminded, man, I don't use the Holy Spirit nearly as much as I should. I want to change, and the Holy Spirit is a vehicle for that. You see, the Holy Spirit makes overcoming possible. Nothing is too difficult for us with the power of God working in our lives. Romans 8.26 tells us that God's Spirit helps us in our weakness. Paul, who wrote the letter to the Romans, speaks for all of us when he said, 
I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. You have a problem with bitterness? Through Christ, he can strengthen you. You have anger in your heart? Through Christ, he can strengthen you. You have non-forgiveness? There's people who you haven't forgiven? It, through the name of Jesus, there is power, and he can strengthen you. Jesus promised Christians that with all all with God, all things are possible. This Matthew nineteen twenty six and Mark ten twenty seven, and we live a life of overcoming. God doesn't want us to, you know, remain where we are, and He doesn't want us to stay stagnant for our walk. He wants us to to grow spiritually, to eat meat, and that is a growing process. But He's there with us every step of the way. We're not alone. He says not to be conformed. We're instructed not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's Romans twelve two. And I'm here to tell you that it was it is my personal experience that that can happen to anybody who wishes to have that level of intimacy with God. God can transform your heart in such a way that you look at you think about a person one minute you, and and you look at him and you can look at him with total different eyes. One of my prayers is, Lord, help me see men and women as you see them. And I'm sitting looking at this person. I'm like, oh, God, that's how you see them. Poor thing. He's lost. Man, he is lost. And I feel compassion because he doesn't have the truth in him. Another wonderful, incredible thing is that the spirit of God convicts our conscience and helps us see the sin it really is. I, I, was, I had to repent for having those feelings towards another fellow human being. I had to say, that, Lord, I'm sorry. You know, I, I fail yet again to see them as you see them. But thank you for changing my heart at the right moment, at the right time, so that I could be a blessing to them and I can make him laugh and I can at least still a little bit of joy in their life. Not that you can still a little bit of joy in their life through me and through my obedience. And I thought, man, that's incredible. I mean, that's awesome. And then finally, the Holy Spirit produces godly fruit in us. That is just really cool. And what are the fruits of the Spirit? Love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, Galatians 5, 22 to 23. And so if you have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you know, I have received it. And that's another incredible testimony for later on. But I know that the Holy Spirit resides in me. You can use the Holy Spirit and ask him, change me, change me, change me. I don't like who I am. I don't like to be so judgmental. I don't like to be so full of hate. I don't like to be, you know, full of these things. Change me. Give me a new heart, Father. And the Holy Spirit will produce the fruit in you. So you can then, God, through you, minister to a hurting world. And that's what's going to happen when good Lord pulls the red lever down. When the good Lord pulls the red lever down, that's not the time to be sad. That's not the time to be hurting. That's not the time to be angry with God. Oh, Lord, you know, the nuke went off and all of a sudden I'm homeless. That's not the time. That's the time to rejoice. That's the time to have love, to have joy and peace. And when people see that, those fruits of the Holy Spirit in you, in the middle of the catastrophe, where buildings are missing and crumbling, people are going to come to you and say, why aren't you upset? Why aren't you angry? And you can say, because. Because he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. And let me tell you about my God who dwells in me. Man, Johnny, we have hope in him who is risen. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Back to you, brother. Well said, brother. Praise Jesus. Thank you, Father. That's awesome. Yeah, amen, man. Amen. Praise Jesus. And on that note, um, check in the time. Hallelujah. I'm going to try to stay on track. We got a ton of news ton of news, and I also want to hit some prophecies as well. Matter of fact, I'm going to jump ahead and hit the prophecies right now. Praise God. All right, some of these I've been holding off on to do all at one in one fell swoop. So they might be a couple of weeks old. They might be a week old. They might be today. Okay. But they're all relevant and consistent. Praise God. All right. And this one is from uh, Glinda 
Lomax from Wings of Prophecy, Prophecy, Just Praise Him, and it came out just today, and it's entitled Get. And also, uh, just so you know, Sister Terry Hill sent me an email and was like, oh, my gosh, this is a hum-, you know, she would, you could, the tone of the email was huge confirmation for her. All right, quote. America, you face nothing but waiting for fiery indignation. You have incurred my judgment, and you shall feel it. The wicked who reside in you shall feel it. All those who helped to make you what you are today shall feel it. Then she says on a side note, she says, Note, for just a second I saw flames, and I felt we had been hit with a missile. I heard the words, quote, preemptive strike. But I didn't know what the situation I was seeing actually meant. I saw President Trump's face for a split second, and after after that, I saw the flames and heard those words. But I knew, even as I saw it, that we had not fired a missile on anyone else. Someone else had fired upon us. Then the Father goes on to say, quote, America, you have already been found guilty. Get ready. I would have washed you clean, but you refused me. You have continued to push me out, out, out. You did not desire to know me. Now you don't. I will cleanse America with fire. Only my remnant shall I protect. They shall walk through the fire and overcome to witness of uh, to others of me, praise Jesus, hallelujah. All right, uh, and this one uh, fresh off the presses from uh, Z3 News, um, and uh, apparently from a person by the name of Christopher Harris. And I'm just I'm not going to read this one verbatim, uh, but it caught my attention, and uh, I I, I uh, wanted to share it real quick. The title is "This Will Be the Most Evil Man in All of the Existence Once the Spirit of Satan Has Fully Possessed Him." And by the way, this is referring to Barack Obama. So uh, you know, again. Um, yeah, I'll just go ahead and uh, we got plenty of time, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, read this pretty quick, uh, so you can get the point of it. Uh, but essentially, what really caught my mind was the fact that the he- you know the headline uh, or, or what this person Christopher had felt uh, was that uh, Satan will fully possess Obama, you know, eventually, and. Um, that's the key to understanding. A lot of Christians out there are like, wait a minute, how can you say that Obama is the Antichrist? He doesn't, meet the, he doesn't meet the requirements. He doesn't meet the requirements. Well, to some countries, he does already meet the requirements. There are people in other countries who adore him. They adore him deeply. Anyway. When he's fully possessed by by Satan, when Satan incarnates, you know, uh, when the abomination of desolation is found standing in the holy place, which is the temple, body, body, all throughout the New Testament, the temple is the body. The temple is the body. What temple ye are. Let the reader beware. Jesus was warning us in that scripture when he said, the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. Let the reader beware. He was telling us he's talking about Satan standing in the body of a human being. Not the temple over in Israel. It says, I never paid much uh, thought or interest to who exactly the Antichrist is. I assumed he had not been revealed yet and that he was nobody, uh, uh, that he was nobody people had seen so far. I was still of this opinion, but this has changed recently. I was seeing many of the brethren uh, point to Barack Obama and the anti- uh, as the Antichrist beast. I wasn't sure of this, but I was open-minded. But as I say, I thought the Antichrist would be somebody new. This was until my dream a week ago uh, on September the 4th, which, which I will tell you now. In the dream, I was walking uh, with a few members of my family, and we entered into a building that was meant to be a store of some kind. Within, within was a military-controlled building with soldiers around. They did not notice us. It felt like it was a hidden place or was meant to be secret. 
I walked over into another room, and there was this large stone tomb, like a sarcophagus. It was cube-like and shaped like a rectangle on high walls, four to five feet high. I looked inside and saw Obama laying in the tomb with his arms folded over his chest and his eyes closed. I looked like It looked like he was in a type of stasis. Then he slowly started to rise, still with his eyes closed and arms folded over his chest like a vampire, like demonically raising up the upper half of his body. My sister got close and was in Intrigued, so I told her something like, "Don't get too close, uh, or don't get close to him. This will be the most evil man in all of existence. Once the spirit of Satan fully, uh, uh, fully has possessed him, he will rule the world, and the world will worship him." Amen. And I, I'm not going to read the rest of it. I'm going to leave it, leave you there. And you can go to z3news.com and take a look at it yourself if you feel led. Christopher Harris uh, is the person who had this dream and now feels compelled to tell the world that Obama is the Antichrist. The next, uh, the next one is a trail of tears leads down their path of destruction. I'm reading this from God's Healer 7. Sister Barbara uh, spoke this prophetic word. Judgment comes to the unrepentant, for it is truth that speaks this day. A trail of tears lays down their path of destruction. Patience has met with indifference. Speak now, son of man. Reveal the travesty of nations. Open the eyes of the non-believers. Amen. For justice stands in readiness. I shall humble the proud and punish the wicked. In the twinkling of an eye, the wealth of nations shall disappear. Their own words shall be used against them. Fire shall rain down from the sky, and it shall bear witness to my judgment. And that's the end of it. By the way, this looks like this was Brother Dan. As if it's not really relevant, because a husband and wife are one flesh, and so there is some, you know, that you get it. But anyway, praise Jesus. Uh, this is pretty interesting, because what we're seeing right now, I'm just sharing, in case you haven't noticed, is there has been a, a, an alarmingly noteworthy uptick. And I know when, you know, Brother Jeff Byerly is probably going to listen to his show sometime tomorrow. And when he does, he's going to be like going, yes, 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 and, you know, happy because I mentioned this. But, um, you know, Brother Jeff is obsessed with the fact that the Lord told him about fire being a major part of what he was told, by, you know, through the, through the Spirit of God, that will be part of an event that is earth shattering and earth changing. It changes everything and and jettisons the entire world into, uh, you know, the the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, you know, the the sorrows period that Jesus warned us about, uh, Revelation chapter six, which comes first uh, before the great tribulation. And the rapture. Now, uh, uh, so anyway, this this theme, this repeating theme of fire raining down from the sky, fire, 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 over and over and over again. And you know what? It's too prolific. It's too pervasive. It's too widespread. The scope is obviously something pretty darn big. Uh, and I just can't imagine at this point that this would be something like a volcano where it would be relatively limited and considered even a big volcanic eruption would be still considered by the unrighteous as being, um, you know, pretty commonplace, especially in the last eight to ten years. All right. Praise God. So something fiery, whatever that may be. Now, a lot of people go, oh, that must be a nuke. Could be. One thing is for sure. The whole wide world will freak out if someone sets off a nuke. And there is no question in anybody's heart, even the unrepentant sinners of the most sinful place on earth will have no doubt that fire is associated with a nuke. So that could be true. What if it's more than one? Or what if it's a meteor shower? We have prophecies and dreams, and I'm just sharing. I'm not going to give you the details of them because it takes take too long, but I, I have them on tribulation-now.org. And there are um, those who have seen things happening in outer space, 
like giant asteroids smashing into the other side of the sun, causing a, a huge solar storm like the Carrington event. I'm not talking about a, a you know an X an X a nine CME type of thing. I'm talking about a Mac Daddy, you know, ten times bigger than the Carrington kind of you know power grids going down type of thing. And in the midst of all of that stuff meteors start smashing down into the earth like you see in a lot of the apocalyptic movies all over the place and in one uh people a person sees uh fires uh all across america fires just fires burning out i would have to assume it's not just america it was probably that it was an american that happened to receive that vision and usually when you live in madagascar and you receive a vision you receive a vision about madagascar if you live in nigeria you get a vision about nigeria that's just how god works he oftentimes it's it's kind of unusual that god now sometimes god will lift you up or lift the individual up and he'll do a multi-phased vision the bigger ones that are well known out there uh you know and um and uh you know you'll see something happening in California and then at toward the end after like two or three pages of the, of 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 the person sharing their vision that then you see they get lifted up above the earth and they are shown by god that these things are happening on a global level see which is really really important cuz that's how god shows us that it's not just an earthquake in California, that this is the sixth seal. You see how that works? So you always need to be attentive. Read to the end and see if God shows them things happening on a global level. Because when, you know, when there's global earthquakes, that's six seal stuff for sure. Praise God. All right. All right, but but just a limited meteor shower with a solar uh, storm and 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 power grid outages, you know, across developed nations, that's not necessarily six seal. Amen. Could be, could be, but not necessarily. All right, praise Jesus. All right, listen to this. This is another one from God's Healer Seven from a couple of days ago. The eye of this of this of the destroyer is now visible. This is interesting. Barbara, let my children know this. Many don't see with spiritual eyes, but your technology lets them see with the world's eyes. Look at the wind. The eye of the destroyer is visible. Don't let your heart faint. You have been warned. You can see the eye plainly, and yet you do not repent. You stand naked before me, mocking and laughing. I know who you are. I have seen your sins. Review in your mind what I have seen. Are you proud? Your nation is being destroyed because you have you uh, because of your actions. Do you understand? I have sent messengers to warn you. Soon their job will be finished. And I had somebody write me, praise Jesus, and say, "Well, isn't the destroyer a reference to Planet X?" Well, yes, but it the way God works is He uses terms like destroyer in many, 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 many different places uh, to describe different things. So lines upon lines, precepts upon precepts, here a little, there a little. Praise God. This is from Julie Wedby. This is from a couple of months ago. My arm of protection is now lifting. Okay, this is from Behold I Come. Julie Wedby. My arm of protection is now lifting. This is the beginning of sorrows. Well, I have to, all I can say is a hearty amen to that. I believe we've been in the beginning of sorrows, and I believe that this prophecy is a confirmation of that for a very long time. Matter of fact, we may have officially entered the, quote, beginning of sorrows, not the sorrows period, which is in the midst of World War III, Revelation chapter 6. We're not quite there yet. Uh, there was a prophecy from God's Healer 7 that said that, that we have, you know, the first seal – indisputably the first seal has been opened uh and um and that would mean that the second seal would be the beginning of world war 3 the third seal would be the the resulting global financial collapse and then the fourth seal holy megarol that's like um, <laughs> all hell breaking loose all on a worldwide level that's just really 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 super bad and then after that what do we got six seal Three days of darkness and rapture. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. And that's multiple confirmations over a decade of time, at a minimum. Praise Jesus. And we don't know about the multi-phased rescue mission yet, so stay tuned. Maybe the Father will reveal more, and maybe he won't. 
Maybe he won't. Maybe he already revealed all he's going to reveal. Praise Jesus. Amen. All right, and on that note, I'm taking a look at the clock. We've got some other really, really awesome prophecies uh, that uh, uh, that we're going to queue up for the next program. Praise you, Jesus. And at this time, Jose? It's what's uncanny is how all of these signs, because I've been working with, with these signs for a while now, they are increasing and they're becoming more visible. And we have today the technology. One of the signs is that knowledge shall be increased. Well, we can know something that happens on the other side of the globe instantly. And it's almost as if all of this stage has been developed just so God can show us in real time his judgments, in real time what he thinks about us, in real time how things are developing. You look at the TV today, you look at the news outlets, and you're thinking, my goodness, I mean, what is happening to the world? And so it's a matter of the heart to be able to say, you know, I recognize this. This is in my Bible. This is God pouring little by little because of his gracious mercy, his wrath upon us. And some other people will say, well, it's just business as usual, which which is another sign. So very interesting times that we're living in, Johnny, and it's just incredible. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be able to report on these things, to herald the coming of our king. Back to you, Johnny. Praise God. And on that note, let's go ahead and, uh, hey, kids, are you there? (laughs) Awesome. Uh, That was my favorite part of the show. I don't know about (laughs) y'all. All right, kids, are you ready? Okay, here we go. What's an artist's favorite kind of juice? What's an artist's favorite kind of juice? An artist. Crayon berry. (laughs) What do you think, kids? Cranberry. Uh, uh, I thought that was kind of funny. All right. Uh, all right, you guys, a tough audience tonight. All right, kids, kids, what's a soda's favorite subject in school? What's a soda pop's favorite subject in school? A soda. Physics. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> come on. Oh, yeah. oh, come on. Oh, for crying out loud. All right. Uh, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. All right, let me try this one. <clears throat> gotta redeem myself. What did one wall say to the other wall? Meet me at the corner. <laughs> come on, kids. Come on. You gotta give me a... oh, okay. Uh, Boy, I was beginning to think I completely lost it. <laughs> get... Oh man, I've I've had three strikes here out, and then I had to go on to four and five jokes to try to get at least one cheer from the kids, right, kids? <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, for crying out loud. Oh, well. What are you going to do? You know. Huh. Duck under your desk. It's Hillary. Did you see her? Jose, did you see her in the chopper? I'm, I'm, I'm still I'm hiding. Are you? You're still under the desk? That was a bright light. They're looking. I, I think they're looking for us, man. <laughs> Praise God. I think there as a matter of fact, wait a minute, wait a minute. Line three is lighting up right now. Line three. Fox more Baxicaba. Edge she vote me. She won't have. Is this wrong? What? This is disturbing. <laughs> yep, that was Hillary, all right. <laughs> Scary stuff. But we all know they're here, don't we? They're here. Right, Jose? Absolutely. 
<laughs> Except, you know, are we there yet? This is the slow motion version. <laughs> are we there yet? No. 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 Are we there yet? Are you little? Oh my God! That's how I feel sometimes, stuck in a La, La Brea tar pit, <laughs> wondering what this, what's going on here? What are we still doing here? You know, it's, it's this whole thing. Uh, th- this echoes in my head sometimes. Same as it ever was. 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 Oh, same as it ever was. Ah, oh, praise Jesus, hallelujah. But you know what? I got a feeling some of those prophecies that came in recently regarding those hurricanes, we might not have gotten impacted quite as bad as many of us expected, including myself. But God does hear the prayers of his saints. And that's going to be a difficult thing for a lot of us to get our arms around. The you know the balance of well is it a judgment and did God you know and what you know why and how come and didn't it and why didn't and you'll have these people going it's a judgment it's a judgment it's a judgment and then when it turns you know when the earth when the hurricane like you know makes a curve they'll they'll say things like uh, oh but I believe that God did hear the prayers of the saints you have that all the time so um, and that's fine. Because it's true. (laughs) Hallelujah. It's just hard to get your arms around because the dynamics, the fluid dynamics of the kingdom will drive somebody crazy when they're listening to the prophets warn, judgment is nigh. Judgment is nigh for five, six, seven, eight years. And then we're we're like, oh, here it is. Uh, The big red lever is getting pulled. And then all of a sudden it looks like there's an act of mercy. Does that mean that judgment isn't here? Or does it mean that there will be waxing and waning and merciful acts of mercy by God all throughout this transitional period that we're going to be going through over the next, without, who knows how long, right? Amen. I thought we were going to be out of here in 2011 for crying out loud. And here we are, same as it ever was. <laughs> Praise Jesus. Let's go ahead and hit the news. Gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? It's not normal. It's just wrong. Uh, wrong. It's not normal. This is disturbing. <laughs> Game over. All right, so let us not forget that this Saturday is September the 23rd, uh, and um, uh, there's uh, a lot of work out there, um, including books that have been written. Um, and I, you know, I feel bad at this point for even mentioning names, so I'm not gonna, but there, there, uh, uh, it says things like Christian, this is right off of Fox news, biblical prophecy claims world will end on September 23rd. Christian, Christian numerologists claim, uh, so we're going through another hyper cycle. Uh, you can map it back over to, um, you know, Harold camping, uh, May 21st, 2011, which I was excited about. I wanted to go, but I had a hunch. And then, um, uh, you know, September, tw- don't, you know, don't even get me going on September 23rd and the super blood moon and, you know, the biblical blood moon tetra at the end, and, you know, praise God. We just got to hang in there, folks. We got to run that race. And here's the thing. When you run a race, do you exhaust yourself or do you pace yourself? Think about that. Do you exhaust yourself Or do you pace yourself? Do you pray for blessings and change? Do you pray for new beginnings in your life? Or do you give up on blessings that God might want to give you? Because all heck, the apocalypse is upon us. It is very hard to live both sides of the blessings life 
and knowing what's coming. It is hard. I've been doing it for a long time. If anybody would have told me in 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016 that I would be here in 2017 in September 20th, Oh, boy, I would have been like, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, let's go ahead and uh, hit some more of these headlines. This is from the top news section. Caribbean in the Gulf of Mexico acting as, quote, the day after tomorrow. This is from the Big Wobble, and he gets it. He totally gets it. Uh, as he says, as another massive earthquake hits Mexico, massive magnitude 7.1 again. Uh, so he's uh, calling out the Chiapas uh, uh, earthquake, which was approximately that same magnitude that was off the coast of Mexico. And then pointing out that, you know, essentially they're back to back in the midst of all the, uh, the, the, the uh, mega Cat 5 events that we have happening. It's very, very day after tomorrow-esque. Very day after tomorrow-esque. And really, when you look at the, the melting of the ice, don't forget uh, the uh, an anointed seer of God, a very Christian man. His name was Nicholas Senior. Senior. Nicholas Senior. Okay, from Africa. He was, uh, you know, lived in Africa. And uh, he uh, was told by the Lord, uh, he saw World War One or, no, wait, what was it, uh, World War Two, and then World War Three, And he uh, saw, um, they asked him, well, when will these things happen? He, referring to World War Three, And he said, when the ice melts. Well, these things are happening now. Not only has the Larson B ice shelf cracked off a big part of it, but there's another bigger section that's getting ready to crack off. Folks, we're so far beyond. We are, we are literally living the movie the day after tomorrow. It's just happening slower than most of us thought. All right, praise God. Listen to this. Mexico earthquake death toll surpasses 200, and it is heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. When you watch the things that are happening down there and the people standing hoping to hear one more person's voice cry out from the rubble. Man, we all got to be on our knees, folks, praying for the Lord Jesus to just fill us with compassion, but also fill us with the ability to remain supernaturally productive as these things are occurring. Right now, my current phase, the place that I'm at right now, because the Lord has been changing me a lot lately and blessing me. Uh, it's a roller coaster ride for me right now. Um, but when something, when, like today, I was sitting, starting my work day, and there were so many sirens outside of my house. I mean, it was massive emergency first responders of all different varieties. You know how you hear, like, you know, six different types of sirens all at the same time wailing? And it was big, whatever it was. Well, sometimes I turn on my police scanner, but I didn't this time. And I just, my head just went right down and snapped down right into my hands. It was almost Im impulsive, like a reflex. And I said, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I pray that you will dispatch your angels onto the scene of whatever is occurring. Father, in the name of Jesus, if people have died at that scene, I pray that you will send your angels into the spiritual realm and snatch them. Snatch their souls out of the hands of the forces of darkness and give them another chance to repent before thee, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. If there are people who are sick, if there are people who are hurt, send your angels down. Cause supernatural miracles to occur, Father. Save the souls. Uh, you know, and just, just call it out. Because God uses our prayers for some reason and don't ask me to explain it God has revealed to me and other people over the years which you know I've learned about because the Lord showed it to me that it is our prayers that call down heaven's resources heaven's angels into action upon the earth wish I'd have known that 10-15 years ago but I didn't. But I was so seeped in sin at that point. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Jesus, for waking me up. All right, Maria slams St. Croix, rips across Puerto Rico, and right now all the news is going that Puerto Rico's in a total blackout situation. So if they got some power restored, then that's a miracle, but they got, it was bad. Really, really, like, you know, 100-year type stuff. 
And now they're saying that Maria is going to take a swing uh, up and do kind of like a, a, a Jose, a Hurricane Jose dealy, uh, and uh, you know maybe maybe not impact the East Coast of the United States. They're totally up in the air. They got their spaghetti models, which I don't trust as far as I can throw them anymore because they dorked up Irma. Every single call they made with Irma was. It was dorked up. It was dorked up. Oh, it's going to go up the East Coast. Oh, it's going to go up a little bit. Oh, it's a note. We changed our mind again. It's going to go to West. It's going to go to West. It's going to go to West. Okay, now it's going to go to the Gulf of Mexico. Now it's going to be a direct strike right on Tampa. Oh, wait, no. Wait, 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 wait. We changed our mind. Now the eye of the hurricane is going straight into Florida, and it's going to disintegrate before it heads north. Every single one of their calls was wrong. I don't trust them. I, I had my contractor friend go down and cut me lumber for all my windows because I had a makeshift. for When Irma came through, I had <laughs> anything I could find laying on the floor at Lowe's. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, uh, it's uh, stuck up on my windows. Uh, I got, I got it. I, the Lord did bless me. He told me to wake. Uh, I woke up early in the morning, and He told me go to Lowe's. I was getting on my knees to pray. I never leave my bedroom without praying, unless I'm feeding the dogs real quick or something, because I want to spend extra time with the Lord. But this particular morning, because all the plywood had been sent down to Fort Lauderdale in Miami, uh, this particular morning, there. I had no reason to believe that there was anything because the stores were completely obliterated. It looked like a hurricane went through the stores. And it was like 6 a.m. in the morning of all times, dark. And I heard the Lord say, go to Lowe's now. I was like, I was like, what? No, Lord, I got to pray. Go to Lowe's now. I was like, okay. And if you knew me and you knew how totally not me this is, I'm the type of person to say, oh, heck, there's no way there's going to be anything at Lowe's when I get there. That's how I am. That's how I am. And then I will say to myself, I'm just going to trust in the Lord with all my heart, lean not on my own understanding. And always I'm going to acknowledge him and he will direct my path. Uh, You know, you you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon you because he trusts you. You will not be afraid of evil tidings. Uh, uh, Your heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Three of my favorite trust verses. That's what I do. I'd quote them and I I would do the dumb thing and not go to Lowe's. But this time I felt pretty strong that I was hearing from God. And I went down there, and by golly, there was a big stack of this concrete wall stuff that they used to put behind tiles and tubs. You know, it's, I don't know, I don't know what you call it. But anyway, some kind of reinforced, steel reinforced board. That was a big stack of it. And I actually got 12 sheets and, and some other stuff, a whole bunch of other stuff. But that was from God. The Lord is, I don't know about you, but the Lord is speaking to me, and I'm hearing him more clearly. I had a conversation. He said something to me just this morning because I was feeling bad and depressed, and, you know, like I let him down, and he, he, he just, I forget what he said, but he said something to me, and he's like, no, you are hearing my voice. He was, like, reassuring me. I hope that these things are happening to you, too. Uh, Hurricane Maria knocks out power on the island of Puerto Rico. Another one. Tropical Storm Jose still lurking, threatens threatens the northeastern part of the United States with flooding. Uh, Another one. Wildfires are so intense in the western United States and Canada that smoke drifted all the way to Europe in four days. It's folks, this is very, all this stuff is very apocalyptic. And I do admit that there have been very similar uh, upticks uh, uh, of this type of stuff uh, before, so, you know, cyclical. Uh, now, not Category 5 back-to-back earth, you know, uh, hurricanes, okay? Uh, but we have had, you know, in 2011, 2012, we had humongous earthquakes. Uh, uh, you know, a one, one uh, that was an 8.2 off the coast of Chile that actually caused the earth to shift on its pole and the airports to have to recalibrate their um, radars. All right, I'm going on. Trump vows to destroy North Korea if, if it poses a threat to the United States. Now, in this particular case, he came out in the front of the United Nations and the whole rocket man, rocket man, rocket man thing, you know, kind of downplaying the significance of the threat, uh, which some people believe was not a good, smart call on his part. And um, he came out and said, we will utter, essentially, he said he, that we will, that the United States of America will totally destroy North Korea. Uh, you know, if Pyongyang doesn't stop its nuclear and missile tests, 
uh, uh, calling Kim Jong-un a rocket man on a suicide mission. Here's another headline. In warning to Pyongyang, B-1 bombers, F-35s hold mock bombing drills over the peninsula. All right. So uh, the provocations of, you know, our biceps are bigger than your biceps continue on a daily basis. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. There's a lot of these things that are not hitting the mainstream news. Listen to this headline. United States, South Korea plan to carry out naval drills involving United States aircraft carrier. Uh, it says in here, this caught my attention because we're watching for the prophecy of the sinking of the, of the United States aircraft carrier uh, that has been seen by multiple anointed people. Uh, and, um, and, uh, uh, and, and it's going to be one that has a president's name on it, probably the United States Ronald Reagan that's, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's the part of the world that it's assigned to, to, to Japan. So it'll probably be there. So we don't know. We don't know. We're watching. Another headline, Pyongyang approaching final stage of ICBM development, according to the South Korea, uh, Korean um, uh, Ministry of Defense. So this is pretty huge. These are very reliable sources. Praise God. All right, let's go ahead and hit uh, as in the days of Noah. Praise Jesus. And I see you there on the call, Doc, uh, uh, brother and reverend, Dr. Joel Graves. God bless you. Hang in there for us. We're running about five minutes behind. I just got to hit a couple of headlines really, really fast to catch up because we're just getting bombarded with apocalyptic headlines. Glory be to God. I saw on your Facebook page that you are totally on top of uh, the uh, apocalyptic timeline that we are in and how, uh, you know, our time on this earth is short. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for your work. All right. Praise God. And, and definitely do not forget and don't be shy to give resources out for your ministry, uh, 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 Dr. Graves, uh, where, the, where people can find you on Facebook, uh, your websites, any of that stuff, your books, any books that you've written. God bless you, brother, for joining us. Hang in there for us so we can slam out the rest of these headlines. All right. Listen to this. As in the days of Noah, British supermarket offers finger vein payments in worldwide first. So they're using biometrics, the touching of skin against an object for payments. And they're doing it overtly at supermarkets, <clears throat> one in particular, at least at this point, in cost-cutter stores uh, in London. Amen? So the mental programming of getting everybody to the point where they can, you know, wave their hand with a chip inside of it. And remember, I was telling people, and I got rebuked for this. People were like, oh, you can't say that. I was warning people to watch out because the chip alone does not meet the biblical criteria, the biblical criteria of the mark. The mark has to be a visible mark. If you look at the, the Greek words, it is an emblem. It is visible. It is something you can see from afar. Well, now we have conf confirmation from uh, visions uh, from very godly people, from a very godly person in, indeed, uh, from un, un, uh, the he senior pastor of Unleavened Bread Ministries, and uh, he was shown by the Lord that it's both the chip and a mark that is stamped on the hand. Okay, so now we have our confirmation. Another headline, a mystery illness is turning Pennsylvania into uh, Pennsylvania wildlife into zombies. And it actually shows some of the birds and explaining this particular creepy uh, sickness that is uh, spreading across that part of the world right now. And it, they do look like it, and it's kind of heartbreaking and creepy and sad. Uh, anyway, let's go ahead and move on to the next headline. Praise Jesus. <laughs> Researchers have linked a human brain to the Internet for the first time. Linked it, linked it, linked it, linked it. So they're doing that whole brain merge thing, you know, EEG, uh, emotive EEG connectivity to the Internet. And they're trying so hard to turn us into nanobot-driven, uh, chemtrail-poisoned, uh, uh, hybrid, uh, uh, you know, Nephilim of some type. And I, I fear that a lot of people that have been implanted by, you know, these creatures uh, are halfway there already. Uh, implanted microchip to replace credit cards and car keys. So they're pushing that again. Uh, BBC News uh, showcased uh, this, uh, uh, and over 3,000 people have received it in Sweden. Some of, the, some of the countries over in Europe are really clueless. Some of them aren't. 
transgender issues dividing schools, parents, and kids in the United Kingdom, on and on, LGBT, LMNOP, QRST, and what else will be next? Preaching behind our pulpits. Desperate Yemeni sells organs to survive. This is just awful, folks. Praise Jesus. Now we're doing signs in the sun and the moon and the star. Seas roaring. Apopka home sparked, uh, I'm sorry, spared by Irma is now swallowed by a sinkhole. This is an awesomely terrible, awesomely terrible report. Uh, These poor people all just (laughs) ducked uh, destruction by a hurricane and then wake up the next day, or I don't know if it was the next day, but a couple of days later, and they're, you know, just humongous uh, sinkhole just sucked practically half of their home down into the hole. Montana snow about 60 days early. We were talking about cataclysmic global climate change. It's not global warming. It's not global freezing. It's all of the above. And we know what's causing it. It's in the Bible. Praise God. Listen to this. Enormous sinkhole drains lake in Franca, Brazil, killing thousands of fish and almost sucking down a boat. And they have a video of it. And it is... uh, Well, they just basically come up out out and say right here in the report, it says this footage is absolutely, well, it says it's just terrifying with an exclamation point. You can see that again. Here's another headline. Stay out of the water. Sharks invade flooded Miami streets uh, during the Irma uh, 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 flooding. And they actually have footage of sharks. And the only kind of sharks that have the kind of dorsal fin, these look like bull sharks. And, oh, my gosh, can you imagine? I don't even want to go there. All right, praise Jesus. Listen to this. Typhoon Talim to descend on Russia's uh, Primorsky territory on Monday. So, again, uh, the apocalyptic weather patterns are so pervasive all over the world, and we're just so obsessed and, and, and myopic oftentimes in America of our own problems that we lose track of how horrible the situation is on a global level. A uh, coronal hole blasting Earth with solar winds traveling at speeds of nearly 800 kilometers per second, causing the biggest geomagnetic storms since the last uh, last week's X-class nine flares. OK, so they're watching. They're watching and they're happening, folks. Another major quake strikes off the New Zealand coast just hours after the Mag 7.1 Mexico uh, hits, uh, you know, in, in alignment with the coronal and sun activity. So there is a direct correlation between solar activity with we're seeing a lot of creepy, weird, apocalyptic solar activity lately, and earthquake activity. All right, listen to this. Has the eighth plague returned? Locust swarm around uh, all over the globe. And, it, and this particular, this is from um, <clears throat> from an Israeli newspaper, and they're they're pointing out uh, a number of different places, including Trinidad, and uh, and uh, and a cup, I'm trying to look for one of the other places. Uh, but anyway, uh, a number of places that are getting hit by what they're referring to as apocalyptic level uh, swarms of locusts just ripping up the countryside. Praise Jesus. And then we're hitting the last section of the news. Glory be to God, New World Order, rumors of wars, violence, insanity, and upheaval. Glory be to Jesus. Report, Sudan forces refugee children to recite Islamic prayers in order to receive food. Wow. I just had to put that in there because it was so heartbreaking. Because we need to be reme- we need to remember and we need to be praying. Headline, Syrian army attacked from area where the United States, United States Special Task Units and uh, the SDF operate from. So, again, the Russian papers, the, the, uh, this has been going on for years. It's the black ops. We're trying to continue the wars in Syria, and we have black ops, you know, black ops. Uh, you call them the deep state if you want to, but they're funded by us. You can believe that. There's a reason why the Bible refers to the United States as Babylon the Great. The world, here's another headline. The world is running out of antibiotics, according to the World Health Organization. This is not good news. Not that there is much of that lately. Second night of violence in uh, St. Louis. This is a dated article, a couple of days old. But again, we're expecting that stuff to ramp back up. Uh, Listen to this. U.S. sanctions continue to backfire. China opens a $10 billion credit line for Iran. This is in the midst of all this back and forth. Folks, you know what? Think about this. Every single promise that Trump made on behalf of Israel has not come to pass. And here we are a year later. All the people that have been sticking up for Trump all of this time, 
Oh, he's this. Oh, he's that. Blessed by the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. America has been blessed. Oh, really? Think about it. Here we are a whole year later, almost, almost a whole year later, really close, one. So while all the evangelical Christians that are saying that Donald Trump, who has never repented and admits it live on, the, on, on television programs, on Christian talk, no, oh, but he didn't feel he needed to repent. But he's saved because evangelical Christians are telling everybody that he was and he was chosen by God. Never mind all the Masonic symbolism and everything else under the sun that's going on and the creepy weirdness. Okay, folks? So just be advised we're dealing with a very dark situation on the earth right now. And if this is a form of mercy from our Father, hallelujah, but don't fall for the deception. Tyranny in Spain. Police arrest Catalan officials ahead of the secession vote. So the Catalonia, which is a section of Spain, is trying to actually secede from the Spanish government. It's causing all kinds of turmoil over there. Uh, Iran's supreme leader vows strong response to the attempts to de- derail the JCPOA, which is that you know that whole Iran deal. And then uh, and the commentary coming out about Iran, you know, Trump and and the United Nations is he's the new Hitler, according to Iranian officials, Venezuelan leaders, uh, and of course you know our friends. In in the North um, Korean area. Praise God. Uh, It just goes on and on and on. Father of all bombs, according to the Iranian Revolutionary Army, central uh, London is uh, evacuated over suspicious this packages. I mean, you just can't, it just doesn't end. It doesn't end. We can sit here and just repeat he- apocalyptic headline after headline after headline, but you know what? We're not going to do that. We're going to bring on uh, Reverend and uh, Brother Dr. Joel Graves and talk about this awesome book, Aliens, God, and the Bible. Uh, and praise Jesus. Let's do that right now. Dr. Joel, are you there? I am. Praise God. Hello? Glad to have you. We're, we're super oh, duper glad. Delay. Yes, there is. There's about a two second delay. Yes. Is that in case I say something bad? No, it has nothing to do with that. It's just one of those blog talk <laughs> radio phenomenons having to do with uh, delays between POTS lines being converted over to voice over IP with, you know, all that kind of stuff. So whatever. Oh, but yeah. we deal with yeah, it's a fun, fun, fun. Praise Jesus. But anyway, um, uh, and I we found your book, Aliens, God, in the Bible, the discussion uh, of, uh, you know, speculative theology. I love how you put that. And um, the way we work on this program, and I did share this with you, um, you know, in back and forth in our emails, is we, we like the, the guest to be able to have as much latitude to share with the listening audience what they believe the Lord has revealed to them in their research and their prayer and their writing of the books, uh, you know, in the Bible, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, rather than being kind of like, you know, coast to coast AM where there, where, where there is this um, practiced, rehearsed set of questions and you can almost, you almost kind of, you know, we tend to take a different approach where we trust the Lord, uh, we do the best we can, and we just, you know, believe that God is going to to, to touch the guest and and help them to reveal mysteries that that were that were shown to them in their research effort. And again, brother, I just love how you put the term speculative theology because that's very that's I think that's a very anointed way of describing the kinds of work that you do and many other people are doing. And I just love this subject. It's one of my very favorites. So on that note, if you will, just, you know, and and I'm not saying I'm going anywhere. I'm going to keep my mic live and I'll be right here in case you you toss a question or you want to go back and forth a little bit, but I'm going to kind of, you know, kind of think of this like a, an electronic ecclesia, a church. uh, And I'm just kind of passing the podium over to you and I'm going back and sitting on a folding chair right there beside you. Okay. Well, you know, I've been listening to your show for the last hour, and uh, I wanted to talk about this September 23rd thing as we start. You know, I, in part of the book, I talk about the end times and 
the whole idea of us being in the end times and that term, that whole idea gets thrown around a lot. And I think it means different things to different people. They have, a, you know, they, they read about wars and rumors of wars in the Bible and, you know, it can be confusing. The apostles, some of the apostles, Peter and Paul, thought the end, they were in the end times and Jesus was coming back. Uh, Martin Luther thought he was in the end times. And uh, the Pope was the Antichrist. And these stories, people going up on mountaintops and the earth being hit by rogue planets and all this is, is nothing new. Jesus actually gave us something very specific. You know, the Jesus and the apostles were in the temple, and Jesus was teaching. In fact, he was teaching on on sacrificial giving. And it seems like the apostles and the people all around him were uh, distracted by the size and magnificence of the temple. Because when they he tells them that uh, he goes and tells them that the this temple itself would be torn down and they were flabbergasted by something like that. And they go off to the Mount of Olives and they, they say, when are these things going to happen? And one of the, one of the verses is very telling. He said, he said that uh, the time of the Gentiles will be fulfilled. And who had Jerusalem when Jesus was here, the Romans, right, Pontius Pilate, and the Gentiles, non-Jews, have had Jerusalem under control for the last 2,000 years. I thought, I thought maybe when they captured Jerusalem after World War II that, okay, that prophecy had been fulfilled, that the Israel was, or Jerusalem was in Jewish hands. But in fact, I don't think that's possible because the dates don't line up. Seems more like when they got all of Jerusalem in 1967 that the clock started ticking for us to know that we were in the end times. Jesus said in Luke 21, Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And so if the fact that Jerusalem was in Jewish hands in 1967, then this is where we, this is where it all begins for us. He, because right after that, he said, I tell you the truth. It's that verily, verily, stop and listen. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. So no matter, no matter what happened before in the previous 2,000 plus years, the people who see Jerusalem end up completely in Jewish hands is the generation to see the end times. So the question is, how long is a generation? Psalm 90 says, the length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength. Isaiah says, at that time, Tyre will be forgotten for 70 years, the span of a king's life. So, I took 70 years to be the length of a generation from beginning to end, from birth to death. That is a, a generation of people. Uh, like we talk right now about the, the generation that fought World War II. You know, they're in their late 80s and 90s now. And so if you add 70 years to 1967, you come up with 2037. Now, people are going to say, you can't, you can't do that. You can't pick a date and say Jesus is coming back in the year 2037. But I didn't do that, did I? I said that uh, there's a window here, which is often the way God works. Well, you know what else? We have, I, just have, I, I, just, I don't mean to, to break your uh, synergy. No, it's okay. But there's, I, I agree. I agree absolutely wholeheartedly. I love it, what you're saying. But the other thing that people miss, and it's because they either have an opinion, whatever that may be, about how the rapture works, 
and where that all fits in the puzzle. But um, And some people just plumb don't believe in a rapture or they think that it happens at the very, very end, which to me, of course, just any sense at all. What's the point in having it? And as a matter of fact, I know, I know as a fact that that is absolutely false because I can show specific, none of the preacher of rapture stuff. I don't use any of those scriptures at all because I am absolutely vehemently against preacher of rapture. Um, what, what I can do is show in Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Revelation uh, 2, verse 11, where the church of Thyatira is cast into the great tribulation, which is we all know is 42 months, 1260 days, time, times half a time, 3.5 years, period. And a story, unarguable. We know that as a fact. All right. And then we, so we know the Great Tribulation is a special period of time. Okay. And, and we know that the Church of Thyatira is cast into a sickbed. Yes, into great. You got to watch out for that. You know, uh, word great has to show up before it. And it is, it's in the text. She's cast into great tribulation because she failed ultimately to overcome, like the Church of Philadelphia, who is delivered from the hour of trial, which comes upon the whole earth to test those who dwell upon the earth. Revelation 3 uh, 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 10. So, so the, the point is, what we know is that we've got these chunks of end times years. Okay, you know, you could say, well, if, if you want to go you use the pre-trip formula, 3.5 years plus 3.5 years, and, and that's, you know, where you're going to go with, you know, that's fine. All I do is I look at Revelation. We got to go through the stuff that's in the seals, and we haven't done that yet. We know that First Thessalonians uh, uh, 5, 9 says, God has not appointed you to wrath. Okay, see, I'm a literalist. I don't play around with metaphors. If, if you know, in my world, proper eschatology doesn't come from a theological institute. It comes from the, the Holy Spirit, hopefully, revealing things through a, to a, a humble and contrite heart that studies the Bible and lets the Lord show it to you. And when the Bible says something, it means it. And when First Thessalonians five nine says, "God has not appointed us to wrath," our job. Is to find out where that. Context. Yeah, and that is exactly what other the, the, uh, theologians have said to me. You're taking it out of context. Oh, really? I don't think so. See, I disagree with that. So anyway, but but uh, and every time somebody has a theological degree, they see context, 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 context. They use that as an excuse to pluck things out to their satisfaction of understanding. And if you spiritually discern the Bible and you believe what God is speaking through the Holy Spirit, rhema word, at the time that it was entered into the Scripture, then you take it at face value. And you wait, wait a minute. Wait, value wait a minute, John. Okay. You said that, uh, you know, we're not supposed to suffer wrath. We're kind of deviating here from what we were talking about earlier, but let me talk about that for a second. You say that that has something to do with the tribulation and the rapture, and it doesn't. When Paul is speaking, in, in, what, what, what does Revelation is thinking, seventeen say? What is Revelation? Read, if you would, for me, brother uh, Graves. Would you read for wait, me wait. Revelation six seventeen? Okay, Revelation six seventeen. Hold that. Hold that thought. We're in First Thessalonians chapter five, verses four through nine. It says, verse nine says, "For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to." The rest of it says, "But to receive salvation through Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ." All through that passage, verses 4 through 9, believers with unbelievers, darkness with light, night with day, sleep with alertness, drunkenness with self-control, and finally, wrath with salvation. Okay? So you can't say, well, now I'm going to apply that to end times theology. It doesn't work. I disagree. Doesn't but work. I disagree. You know what? I'll tell you what. Let's Rather than just going on and disagreeing and me throwing scriptures and you throwing scriptures— Revelation 6.17, I'm going to close with this remark. Revelation 6.17 says, And the day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So God tells us when the wrath period of Revelation begins in Revelation 6, verse 17. Okay? It's there. It's clear as a bell. So anyway, okay. um, but, but if we can, let's go ahead and not, you know, like, yeah, like Romans 14. 
says, like Romans 14 says, let's not dispute over, you know, things like genealogies and all this kind of stuff, because it's it's really irrelevant. The reason why we brought you on the show is because of the aliens, God, and the Bible stuff. And by the way, I totally, totally agree with everything that you said regarding, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, 67 year, you know, 1967, the 70-year thing with the generation. You're absolutely on the money right there. Praise Jesus. The only point I was bringing up, the only reason I was bringing up the rapture part of it was because— if you are a believer in the rapture, which I believe the scripture bears witness to the existence of a rapture, indeed a pre-wrath rapture in my opinion, but it's beside the point. But what I'm trying to say is simply this. We have plenty of time in that window that you define from 1967 to the 70 years for all the rest of it to snap in there. Whatever it may be, regardless of what book anybody has written or what college they went to to get their degree or what they believe in their heart, at the end of the day, 1967 plus what you said with the 70 years is plenty of time. And, what, and what's, what is the conclusion? Well, the conclusion is we're pretty much there, <laughs> which is awesome. We're, we're, almost, we're almost there. We're almost yeah. there because, uh, you know, it's an, it's an approximate date. It's, uh, you know, it, God has the ability to, you know, to move it closer. He said they wouldn't pass away. And, and the idea is, is, you know, a generation being 70 years is, is a starting point. But, there, you know, we can't, we can't say it has to be that way. Earlier in the hour when you were talking before, you were talking about how somebody would prophesy that there would be a destruction and then there would be a mercy. And the, you'd say, well, the prophecy didn't come true. See, that's exactly what was happening when Jonah went to Nineveh. Nineveh was going to be destroyed. And Jonah went over there, just like you said, and said, you guys making a big mistake. You're all messed up, and God's going to destroy you. Well, they repented. They fell on their knees, and they were in sackcloth and ashes, and even the animals. And the destruction didn't come. You know, there's uh, 2037 is a date that we that should give us some sense of urgency and sharing the gospel and in watching what's happening in the world but it's not Amen. uh you know it's like you said it's, it's it's something to watch for it's he said the generation that sees these things happening won't pass away and that just gives us a window to look at what we're going to see is we're going to see a small a small battle in the middle east that will allow jerusalem the israelites to build the great temple on the temple mount and i wonder if the mosque up there gets destroyed or something happens to it so that the mount is just level and a new playing field for them and then of course we you know that's the beginning of the rip of the great tribulation and uh in the middle of the tribulation all kinds of things happen and at the end we have armageddon and then the return of jesus at the very end uh, for the listeners who are interested in what we were talking about with the rapture and where it might fall in all of this, there's a website called raptureofthechurch.org, raptureofthechurch.org. And what it does is it compares the different rapture theories. And then there's a uh, like post-trib, pre-trib, mid-trib, and then there's a comparison chart where it kind of lays all three out together so you can look at them in one easy thing but i wanted to talk about that so that you know there's this thing with the numerology and the nabiru planet slamming into the earth on the 23rd of september there's going to be more like that it's not going to happen no it's not going to happen and jesus said you know there's going to be people that are going to come and say i'm the christ you know and people are going to flock to him and say, Jesus has returned, it's the second coming, hallelujah, everything's good. No, it's not going to be like that. You know, the, Jesus said it himself. He's, you know, he's, he's going to return on a white horse with the armies of heaven and, and uh, at the end of the Great Tribulation and uh, the end of the Armageddon fight. But I wanted to start off with that anyhow and just kind of, people are talking about it. And there's going to be other things that come up you know, as we go along here that are going to be similar to this, and it's going to be the end of the world. Like, I guess it was, what, four or five years ago, the Mayan calendar 
prophesied the end yep. of the world and yep i know, was all was, over was i was all over it so it was a bunch of people <laughs> it was like 2012 <laughs> right? Faith, right yep and that was a big pie in the face for a lot of us yeah it's okay so now we know we've got a window here we're the generation that sees you out of all the other people that came before us for 2,000 years, we're the ones to see it and witness it. And I hope I'm alive to, to be there. I am excited about that because, you know, I'm a Bible junkie, I guess, in that respect. Uh, I love it. And, I mean, it's going to be horrible on one hand. And, and it's, I mean, it's the end times that says if Jesus didn't intervene when he did, nothing would have survived whatsoever. And uh, and yet, we, here we are. We're anticipating it. We're looking forward to it. We want to see it. It's the uh, it's the we're getting towards the end of a long and difficult time and a long and wonderful story. You know, in, in Aliens, God and the Bible, I start off by I, I know that title is rather sensational, and you know I start off by talking about a starship pulling into orbit, and it's the, called the New Jerusalem. The, uh, I don't, a lot of people don't realize that it's a cube-shaped ship like the Borg ship in Star Trek. And the Borg ship in Star Trek was two miles to a side about. It was really big. The New Jerusalem was 1,380 miles to a side in a cube shape. And so I start off the book talking about that, what it is and what it's made of and why it's here, which leads to a discussion of, of the universe and how, you know, what is the universe about? Why, is, why, is, why do things happen the way they happen? Why would God create this giant starship and park it in orbit above the Earth? And... Uh, turns out that just about everything I talk about from Sasquatch and aliens and the Nephilim, uh, Satan's role in all of this and the creation of the universe, it all comes out of Genesis and Revelation primarily. And the Genesis connection is actually very fascinating. And its connection to the New Jerusalem in the end times uh, starts with Adam in the garden. You see, we don't know, if you read Genesis 1 and 2, it, I mean, you can read it in a few minutes and you're done, and it sounds like things just happen, clickety-clickety-clack, right along, no breaks. And, you know, it was, it's actually more interesting than that. See, the Bible, the Bible is interested in what happened to Adam and then everything that follows, the fall, and then the, the time of Adam to Jesus to now, to the end times. It's uh, not interested in what happened to Adam while he was in the garden. He said, let there be light in, chapter, in verse 3, and uh, he created all these things, and then he created man. And then, you know, we read that Eve and he ate the apple and they're out of the garden. What we don't know is how long they were in the garden. And so it's, you can't go back and, and do the genealogy thing and say, well, it's uh, about 8,500 years and, or so since all that happened. That's true. It's, it's something like that, maybe 10,000 years, uh, depending on how you work the genealogy and uh, work through the different gaps in it. But Adam and Eve were in the garden a long, long, long time. And, you know, Adam was in the garden a long time before Eve came along. You know, it says he was in there and he was doing things and he got lonely and God created Eve. We don't know how long Adam was alone. But what I find very fascinating are these stories of human footprints alongside dinosaur footprints. We just had one in the news here a week ago. You know, they were in Utah, and this, this isn't the one from a week ago, but uh, they were in Utah, and they broke open the shale. They split the shale open for the first time in millions of years. And there's human footprints following a dinosaur footprint 
wearing sandals, okay, about a size 10 sandal, following a dinosaur, apparently. Uh, they also found uh, uh, child footprints, and the toes were spreading, they said, in the mud like a child that had never worn shoes. And so in the book, I make a case for Adam being in the garden that when God created the animals, the plants and the animals and humankind, Adam and Eve, that all that happened at the same time. And it was maybe 400 million years ago. There's a, I also, you know, there's lots of stories. Like, I didn't want to, uh, the examples I used, I wanted to be sure that they were antiseptic. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That they were not, uh, they, they were verified, validated, and, and had the least controversy surrounding them. Like people in uh, Oklahoma, people breaking open coal from Oklahoma, lumps of coal and finding objects in them, like brass pots and bells. And the coal seam is dated back to 350 million years. So if you were, if you were a perfect human specimen and immortal and living in absolute paradise, how long would that go on? How long would it last? You know, 400 million is a long, is a, is a big number no matter how you, how you work it. It's a big number. It's, it's, I know some people are going to be listening and going, oh, man, that's really crazy. But you know what? We have evidence in the rocks of human footprints. So I said, well, it must be ancient aliens. You know, 400 million years ago, Adam would be an ancient alien to us. <laughs> you know, the uh, no doubt. But uh, what was I going to say about that? He's, oh, yeah. Let's see. Lost my train of thought. Anyhow, the, uh, uh, let me see if I can get it back. The point is, is that uh, Adam and Eve had children while they were in the garden. They didn't ha start. Ha you remember what I said about the biblical account starting with Adam after he left the garden is what we're interested right. in because the, the Bible after Adam is about redemption and the coming of the Messiah. Right. So we hear that he had, they had two children, Cain and Abel. But one of the curses on Eve, when they ate of the apple, he said, from now on, when you have kids, you're going to, be, you're going to have pain in childbirth. That curse wouldn't make any sense unless she had already had kids. What difference would that make if she, you know, she had already like been having she, children? I like how you think. I really do. See, that, she had Jane already, was, they had already been a, having children. Yep, okay, over 400 million years. But, you know, they were, you know, it's like the movie Avatar. Those you know, people, I heard people say, oh, I wish I lived in the, on the planet of Pandora with the, you no, know, with the, 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 what were they, the, you no, know, anyhow, with those people in, in Avatar because it was so idyllic and wonderful and, and uh, pure. That's the way it was in the garden. Eve had children, and her children had children. Okay, and they were immortal, dynamically healthy, no mental illness. They didn't have the problem. I mean, they were grazing. The food was right there. It was, you just plucked the food and you ate it. Everything was perfect. And so there's this – one of the evidences of that is that when they leave the garden, Adam and Eve, there's an infrastructure already in place. There's seasonal sacrifices. Cain says, I'm going to go get a wife, and he builds a town. I mean, holy smokes. You know, he's like the first kid, right? And he's building a town, and he has a wife. What I think happened was that people had been leaving the garden all along. Maybe they ate of the fruit, got kicked out, or maybe they just said, I'm going to go exploring. And I think that's where we get the Neanderthal from. 
and other beings because 400 million years is a long time and it gives people a chance if they're interested to explore the sciences you know one of the, one of the points i make in the book is that if you the aliens with the big heads and the big eyes if they are descendants of adam and they've gone into outer space and they've had kids the pressure of the eye and the head the natural pressures we have in the eyes and the head will make those parts of the body bigger okay and if you're living in a microgravity then the other parts would be smaller okay you you wouldn't be you you wouldn't have gravity to help build the muscles and bones and so when i see like in the like in uh, close encounters of the third kind you got these little aliens coming down out of the ship right they got these diminutive bodies big head big eyes and i think these are the children of adam and eve from the garden i believe that uh, over 400 million years it seems like some different people took different tracks some people got uh, larger and hairier maybe to deal with their environment and you've got the neanderthal they had a bigger brain than us they were you know people believe they were absorbed into our culture if they had this society going on when adam and eve came out they were all related they were all cousins and so it would be easy to happen and i think the the space aliens these people who have uh spaceships that probably work off magnetic propulsions of some kind peer i think that they have the ability to move between the physical and spiritual realm at will one of those one of the things that uh, i know people roll in their eyes but uh, there's a thing called the sasquatch genome project and they took hair samples and follicles that they found and did a blind study to find out uh, where they're you know what kind of creature is this you know is it an ape or something and the dna came back that ancestral mother is us okay the sasquatch see we're ne- we'd never find a sasquatch village okay or find a tribe of sasquatch wandering through the northwest forest up here you know in the olympia peninsula in fact people who have shot a sasquatch said others came and grabbed them and they disappeared i believe they are able to move between the spiritual world and the physical world the way we walk from the kitchen to the living room that they can move freely between the dimensions whenever they want to they don't even have to make a door they just maybe they just think it think this the space alien cousin is able to do the same thing and uh they're all children of adam and eve like us i don't know i don't know you know people say there's different stories about aliens being captured and crash sites and everything and i wonder if we could ever find somebody who is reliable uh with a with a background in that area and, and uh someone who is involved with that that the dna analysis showed them of the space alien i believe it would be the same as the sasquatch that uh takes us back to a common mother and uh, i know some people don't believe in sasquatch but you know they're seen on every continent every continent and they appear and disappear they're there then they're gone and they're you know they have a human footprint but they're really tall I think they are also uh, that there might have been some here, some there in the Middle East after, uh, you know, when the Israelites were there, they talked about the, these great big people, the Nephilim. And uh, uh, there have been reports of giant men being captured in the South Pacific on islands. They were like 10 feet tall and uh, uh, taken to England. You know, they're all documented and, and everything. So it's uh, it sounds far fetched, but there's all these all this evidence that that leads 
back to this idea of Adam and Eve being in the garden a long time. And then uh, over that extremely long time, different groups diverging slightly, you know, taller, hairier, shorter, uh, some going into space, but all related, all cousins. You know, and the, if the people, if they were not ejected from the garden like us, there, there might be a, there might be space aliens or Sasquatch who knew Adam and Eve. Who knew them? I mean, it's only been about 8,000, 10,000 years since they were ejected from the garden. If these people are immortal because they're still in the spiritual place and able to eat of the tree of life, they may they may be able to tell us tell us stories that about what things were like before the fall. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I like it. I like the way you think. I it's very creative. Um I um I I like the um pl- the statement that J. Vernon McGee made in his book, uh, I think it's called uh, Around the Earth or something like that. I I don't know if I have it handy here, but um, anyway, he said something along the lines of um, that he he believed that God has not, I'm I'm totally paraphrasing, but he believed that God has not given us all the details. He believed that there was uh, pre-Adamic creatures on the Earth, that the Earth is, you know, essentially millions of years old. He, 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 J. Vernon McGee didn't do what a lot of Christians of nowadays do, and they take the position that well, if it's not in the Bible, then I don't believe it. And those same, you know, people will take their children into the Museum of Science and Industry and walk past a 300,000-year-old Neanderthal skeleton, and um, they'll try to smash that skeleton's existence into the Bible narrative. Well, it must be in the Bible. Well, there's no place in the Bible that says that everything's in the Bible. In fact, the opposite is what the Bible says. And the last verse in, in uh, the book of, uh, I believe it's John, uh, says, um, you know, well, I suppose if we had written down everything that Jesus had done, we'd fill up enough books to fill the whole world, which is that's a right. very overt statement that, so everything that's in the Bible is true, but everything that is true is not in the Bible, which is why I just love your premise of speculative theology, because it it demands us to be to use our sanctified imagination and and not do it in and I, again I like how you, you you use the Bible as your baseline litmus test. See that's the key. That's how you well, prevent yourself from going heretical. No, you're exactly right. You've got to you know I believe in the creeds, the Anglican Church's 39 Articles of Religion. And uh, the Nicene Creed, the, and would never suggest anything that would deviate from those. Because if your speculation deviates from the creeds and the Bible message, then you're you're moving off into heresy. Okay, and that's the that's the danger in speculative theology. You've got to have a baseline for starting. If you don't have that, then you could end up with with any wonky thing and the earth's going to end in three days. And when you look at, and, and to, to agree with you further on that point, um, when you look at the scripture, I believe it's Malachi, I think it's Malachi three sixteen. Let me see. Uh, oh, good. For once, once in a doggone moment, I actually <laughs> had, I actually had it open on my thing here. Okay. Malachi three sixteen. I think it is. Hold on a second. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yeah. So listen to this. And I know you know it. Then those who feared the Lord spake often to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate upon his name. And the Father says, They shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. On that day I will make my jewels, and I will spare them as man spares his own son and serves them. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, uh, and, and et cetera. But the point, and then of course you've also got the uh, another scripture. It's kind of a sister scripture from you know from its spiritual meaning, which would be, uh, I believe it's Proverbs twenty five verse two, where it says, "It's the glory of God to conceal with a matter, and the glory of kings to search out a matter." So yes, that's right. people I are so afraid. 
Oh, good, because that's the whole point. God is honored by us being obsessed with his awesome creation and wondering where all this stuff fits into it. No, I, that's exactly right. And that's why I go back and I spend a lot of time in Genesis. I've had, I've had, uh, I've had different friends of mine who were uh, uh, physicists and studied quantum physics and, uh, and, uh, you know, they're, they're concerned with how things work and why they work the way they work. And many of them had written off the Bible as mythology without an imagination. And uh, I've had some people read the book and come back and say, holy smokes, you know, there's something going on here. And, uh, you know, I, as I was writing the book and I was doing the research on, on the universe, I found a physicist in Finland. Let me tell you, when I was a kid, I was I was out. We lived in San Juan Batista. I had a little farm out there on the west side of town. And I was out hoeing in the garden. And I looked up on the hill behind the house. And the grass was, end of summer, bright yellow. And the sky was bright blue. And I was just marveling contrast of the colors. And a thought came into my head. I had been attending catechism classes to prepare for confirmation, and the priest had us read Genesis, in the beginning God. And here I am, I'm, I'm a fifth grader, and I remember thinking if there was absolutely nothing in the very beginning, nothing at all, no dimensions, no space, no, nothing rubbing against something else, absolutely nothing, then where did God come from? Where did God come from? And so my mind has been wandering down paths like that for a long time. Yeah, and, I, I got uh, great on that one. I, I actually said that to the ninth grade teacher. I was like, he was doing the Big Bang thing. And I was like, I was like, but teacher, if there were like gases out in outer space that exploded, then what created that which created the gases. Where did the gases come That's from? Right. The, the That's problem right. is that the human mind is incapable of understanding existence without origin. You know, there's, yeah, exactly. And so I have to admit, I don't know the answer to my own question. I, I guess I'll know the answer when I can stand in front of Jesus and say, you know, where did you all come from before you were here? You know, I what, think I'll just what smile was the at beginning? You. <laughs> what, what was the very I beginning? Smile at you. I think he'll smile at you and say, uh, "We'll have that conversation." So I think he's just going to oh, smile. Oh, you know what? We no, I, we, I, have, I, we can't understand. I thought it. about that. No, I know, and, and you know, maybe when we're in in heaven, we'll understand it because you'll give us the ability to understand it. But what I found out is that. More and more physicists don't believe in the Big Bang. There's more evidence that we were created purposefully and thoughtfully, that, that the universe was ordered from the very beginning and not chaos trying to come into order, which would happen in a Big Bang, but that it was purposeful. And the Bible tells us that. It says God said light, and when he said light, stars were created. Okay, and the universe was formed, and uh, there are more and more physicists who believe that because the the science is telling them that. Okay, they didn't know that the Bible moved in that direction. They just said the science is telling us that something more deliberate happened, but we can't explain it. In fact, one guy said, one guy said, if 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 the way the science is going, then we're going to have to say there was a miracle, and I I. I can't do that. <laughs> I can't say there was a miracle because that goes against all of my all of my training and all of my my uh, everything I learned in college and everything. You can't have a creator. That'd be that's nonsense. That's kind. Of, that's where the Bible leads us. There's. I could talk about that all night. There's a. Yeah, it was. A, you know, the, the idea of a Big Bang came from Edwin Hubble. He he looked out 
at the stars and the redshift and said, everything's moving away from us. But think about this. If we're in a bubble that is 13.8 billion light years across, okay, and everything in the bubble is rotating because everything rotates. I mean, hurricanes rotate. The moon goes around the earth. The earth goes around the sun. The sun is in the arm, the Orion arm of the Milky Way, which is rotating, okay, and the Milky Way is rotating about around other things, and the whole universe is moving. And so if you say from my location, everything seems to be moving away from me, that's a true statement, especially if the light has been traveling for 13.8 billion years before you see it. Of course it's moving. What you're looking at is not in the same location anymore. It's moved on. That star you're looking at is gone. That galaxy you're looking at in Virgo, where there's like 10,000 galaxies, if you look at the ga- up through the Virgo constellation, they're all in different locations now because everything's moving. Everything's rotating. That doesn't – what he did is he said if everything's moving away from us, then it must have started from a speck and exploded outward. Not necessarily. Things are moving because everything's moving. And it's dynamic, and it's alive, and it's breathing. And I think that's why we have things like black holes and dark matter in the universe is because the, the, the universe is alive and singing. The stars are singing, and everything's moving. And the black holes are shifting matter from places where there might be too much to places where it's needed more. It's like a circulatory system, I think, uh, vascular system, respiratory system. Maybe respiratory system is better if I to keep talking about it, breathing and singing and all this, the stars singing. The Bible talks about that. The Bible says God gave them all names. And I think it's alive and dynamic. And I think the purpose of the new Jerusalem, when it first arrives here at the end of the book of Revelation, it's nothing but a lifeboat. It's a lifeboat because it arrives just in time to get us off the planet because the place is a wreck. The forces of Satan have attacked Jerusalem again. It says that they, they all die and all kinds of people die in the Valley of Jehoshaphat and uh, outside the Jerusalem gates and the blood's as high as the bridle of a horse, which puts it about four or five feet tall running down into the ocean. The place is a wreck and God creates a new heaven and a new earth. And I think the survivors are taken off of the planet, put on the new Jerusalem while that happens. Okay? So then when it arrives, it's a lifeboat. But you've got to, then you have a new heaven, a new atmosphere, and a new earth. I think God's going to populate it with all the animals that were here originally, just like he did with the time of Adam. And you've still got this spaceship parked in orbit that's almost as big as the moon. It's just a little, a hair smaller than the planet Pluto. You've still got this gigantic starship parked in orbit. Okay? Now, some people believe the New Jerusalem is, some people believe that heaven is going to be everybody living on the new earth. Some people believe that the New Jerusalem is something like a cruise ship and they're going to live on this for eternity. But, you know, the universe is absolutely huge. And when I, you know, I I spend a whole chapter just talking about how the, well, you know what's interesting? When I talk about how the New Jerusalem will move, it's very interesting to me that God tells us that he's going to change his flag. He's going to transfer his flag from heaven to the New Jerusalem, from the spiritual realm to the physical realm, the New Jerusalem. He's going to change his location. What I find interesting about that is that if God is on the starship, then it will be able to move at the speed of thought. It won't be great big engines or working wormholes and worm windows and time displacement anomalies. God will say, where do you want to go? And I say, I want to go to 
and Terry's. And you're saying, okay, we're there. Move at the speed spot. And uh, that's another thing. You know, it's, uh, I, in fact, I make a reference that uh, I walk up and Jesus is explaining the last movement to Stephen Hawking. And I walk up and say, how did, how did we just do that? You know, how did we move from this star to that star? What's 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 going on with that? And he says, hey, come over and sit with us. I'll just explain that to Stephen. So we have God created God could God could have created a bubble with our solar system in it to satisfy whatever was going on between him and Satan and the and the 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 creation of humans and the fall of humans and the need for God to intervene and die on the cross to redeem us. All he had to do is create our sun, planets, moons, and he didn't have to create everything else. You know, there are more galaxies than we can count. There are more planets and stars then we can imagine. Imagine this. Imagine that the universe is the new Garden of Eden for us, where Adam was created and he gave them na- animals' names and he shepherded them. He was like a shepherd to them. And uh, what if this is, what if because of what happened here, we can get on the, the New Jerusalem and ships like it? I don't think it, it might not be the only one. And go out into the galaxy shepherding civilizations. Yeah, I, we were just talking the other day, today or the day before, about the – well, I was visiting some friends after church, and we were talking about the creatures that fly around the throne of God. They're also mentioned in Ezekiel. They have wings and eyes, and one's a man, one's a bovine creature a bull, a lion, and a raptor, an eagle. Of course, when you hear a lion, you think of Aslan in the Narnia series. But I thought it was interesting that one is a man, and they circle the throne, and they are continuously praising God and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, heaven and earth are full of your glory. What if they represent civilizations? Man is one. What if there are civilizations out there, a bovine, a lion, an eagle civilization where they are active, dynamic, they love music, they worship God, they have a culture, they sing, they write, they have mathematics, they are everything we are or think we are, but they're different and they worship God and they represent civilizations, just like that man creature represents the human civilization. You know, what if we're all supposed to do something? What if we're all supposed to, I mean, are these other creatures, do they, do they have a messianic story also or, uh, or not? What is, what's going on with them? Who do they represent? Some people have said, well, they represent the Gospels, but that's, that's taking it after the fact. I mean, Ezekiel was talking about them before, you know, 500 B.C. was talking about this group. So it's kind of, kind of after the fact applying it to the Gospels. But it kind of it makes you wonder what our purpose is going to be after the end times and as we move into the, into the new age, after the thousand-year reign of Jesus and the end and things and we have the new Jerusalem, I don't think we're just going to sit here in orbit and twiddle our thumbs. We're going to have a purpose. We're going to have places to go. Maybe the new Jerusalem will be the home of a Congress of the created, a, a Congress of the universe, or something like that. And uh, we'll work and work together and help each other and spread across the Universe. So I'll, I'll throw what something. Think about that? Oh, oh, oh man, you, you've met your match when it comes to that kind of stuff. So check this out. All right, so I'll throw this over the wall. You know, there's no way that we can be positive, 100% sure, but 
Okay, so let's assume, let's take another approach and just say to ourselves, let's estimate that God is way, way bigger than our wildest imaginations. That instead of being myopic and self-centered as we are obviously programmed in our DNA with whatever part of the forces of darkness that influence us here in this fallen place. Some people might argue the fallen one-third, perhaps, of the universe. But if we were to stop being myopic for just a second and think that, stop thinking that we're the only pebbles on the beach, because that's what we do. We hold up our Bible. We see that you know all of creation is groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God, et cetera, et cetera. That's us. Right. And we look and we say, what the Bible doesn't say is that we're the only pebbles on the beach. What the Bible doesn't say is that the only sons of God in all of creation exist on planet Earth. The Bible doesn't say that. It says things like, uh, like in Matthew 24, verse, uh, I think it's 29, 30, 31, it says, that uh, that you know that I, I, I'll I'll just read it here. I have I have I can pull it up. But but it's important to pay. To, I believe it's important. Now somebody a lot of people disagree with me, and that's fine. You know we'll find out when we're in that big when when we're at the wedding supper and we've all had our dinner and we're kicking back and Jesus is finally having his first glass of wine with us. Um, we're going to be sitting in front of. I believe we're going to be in front of a big whiteboard in the sky, and we're going to find out who is right, who is wrong. And, and a lot of us are going to d- discover that we had some stuff right and, you know, maybe a few things wrong. But, like, you look at Matthew 24. Uh, I'm a stickler for looking at the jots and the diddles, right? And um, you look at 24, I think it's 30. And, I, you know, again, I don't like other people telling me what to think. And then, so the last thing I want to do is go to a school and have them say, well, you're not going to pass the test unless you believe like I tell you to believe. I, I'm vehemently against that because that robs us of our ability to hear God because we're listening to man, which we're instructed explicitly not to do. All right, so anyway, um, what does it say? Immediately after the tribulation of the day, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give his light, fall from the powers of the heaven, shake, and all that kind of stuff. And it says the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. What is that? That isn't Jesus. It's not talking about Jesus appearing in heaven. It says the sign. <laughs> Let's pay attention to the details for crying out loud in the name of Jesus. It says the sign will appear in heaven. But we right. don't pay attention to that. We just assume that it's Jesus. And the other thing is, it says, and it says all the tribes of the earth will mourn. So people are going to be bummed out. They're going to be looking up in the sky and going, oh, no. All right, but here's the thing that's really cool. When you pay close attention. In verse 31, it says, and he, capital H, would be, essentially that would be our Lord, Jesus, will send his angels with the sound of a, a, a trumpet. But the most important clause, actually the two next clauses of that sentence, that scripture, are what's really important because they divulge a mystery that none of us can know for sure what it means. Oh, we can we can say, oh, you're a heretic for thinking like that. We can we can smash our brain even smaller than it already is into a teensy weensy little thimble, crush God into a twelve ounce can, because we're comfortable with that. But we don't ask, we don't wonder about how big and awesome God is. Instead, we take the opposite approach. We make him small, because we're comfortable with small. It says. And they will gather, the angels, they will gather together his elect. Where from? From the four winds and from one end of the heaven to the other. When you look at the word heaven, a lot of times it's not as what we think. We know that heaven takes on many different meanings. Indeed, in the Hebrew, I would reference uh, Isaiah 13, uh, it's, refers to the Shamayim, and when you look at the uh, Strongs on that, that very well means the cosmos, where the planets revolve. But it can also mean the eternal realm of heaven, it, so it has multiple levels of meanings. Lines upon lines, precepts upon precepts, here a little, there a little. Why in the world does it go? the Scripture go to the trouble of explaining that Jesus' elect, 
are gathered from the four winds. What's the implication there? See, we, we really don't do God justice. What if there are, we already know through the analysis of string theory, which we're just little bitty babies at right now, that there are 11 mathematically perceivable dimensions. So right. why wouldn't it be likely that there's just as many dimensions, just as many parallel universes, and just as many civilizations of beings in all those locations? Okay? And, and, and why wouldn't we? Why would we take the opposite approach and say, oh, no, that can't be true? It, that doesn't make sense. So, so um, uh, you know, um, I know that that opens up questions that, that some people are troubled by. You know, well, was, you know, did Jesus die on a cross in every single different civilization, et cetera, et cetera, that kind of thing. How much of it has fallen, you know? Uh, how much of the universe has fallen? What separates the glorified parts of the universe from the unglorified or fallen parts of the universe? How many civilizations are out there? What, pre, what stops the good otherworldly beings that are glorified. You know, you know what, you know I, what I mean? I, I, what questions was a, kind of there, was a, right? there was a phrase that Jesus used one time. He said, the prince of this world is coming. And I went, the prince, I said, what a peculiar way to describe Satan. The prince of this world. I thought, you know, it made me wonder how big the problem was. That, uh, you know, we, we saw that a third of the angels fell from heaven. And some people say the angels are demons, but I, I don't know about that. I think that there's something else going on with this whole thing about demons, which I talk about in the book also. Yeah, but it's all the above. It's all the if, above. What if, and we don't know what the quantity is when we, we say a third fell with him. We don't know if they were all willing or collateral damage you know i was in the army and you know uh we did what we were told whether we liked it or not but uh let's just assume that a third of the angels fall they're 100 percent with him if they were not with him they wouldn't have been there so they're 100 percent with him they're all bad guys they all fall and one of them is the prince of this world. Is there, would that make someone else the prince of a different world? Is there, are the worlds, and there's trillions and gazillions of worlds, are there, yep. are angels, seraphim and cherubim, and, and different types of angels assigned to different planets as princes, as, as overseers? That uh, uh, would that be a purpose for the New Jerusalem? You know, I, I don't know. It seems like the Earth. When you read Genesis, the Earth was created to deal with a problem. Okay, and that problem was Satan. Yes, and his, you nailed it. Psalm eighty-two is he, brother. You nailed it. You, the the Rama, the, the Holy Spirit just placed that on you. I don't know if you thought about this before, and if you did, praise the Lord, Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. But you're absolutely you nailed it. Psalms it's eighty-two the is the key. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges amongst the gods. He levies a judgment on the minor gods. When we – look, this would just flip out churchianity. Little C churchianity would fall back, and they'd be like, that guy's a heretic. Send him – burn him from a tree. Hang him from a pole. Listen, think about it. If God stands amongst the congregation of the mighty, he judges amongst the gods. Okay, right? And what does he say at the end to the gods? He says, you shall die like men. How does an eternal being, a minor God, die like a man? He's got to be punished, and he's got to be incarnated as part of his punishment as a spirit being. He's got to be incarnated into a host body. Yea, saith the Lord of hosts. That's what that, the yea, saith the Lord of hosts. Why is it all over the Bible that our Lord is the Lord of hosts? It's not talking about the Lord of planets. Host bodies. 
Even my own sister, she's 73 years old, is smart enough to realize that when we die, the spirit man, or you know, you, some people call it soul man, leaves the body. She even says, well, it's kind of like getting out of a car. Oh, that's fascinating. Well, I'm glad you got that down. How about how did we get in here in the first place? Oh, we were breathed into the nostril like like Adam, you know, uh, the the living soul, the capital S living soul was breathed into the nostrils of Adam. It, 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 okay, well, what is that? It's called incarnation. It's not reincarnation. It's in. Car nation. How did a God know that uh, Jeremiah? How did he know him before he was in his womb? How did he proclaim that he was going to be, uh, you know, a, a, a prophet? All the all these mysteries in the Bible. How, how come Jesus said in Matthew uh, uh, ten thirty four, "Have I not said ye are gods?" He was making a direct reference to Psalms eighty two. When we are translated. And, and our bodies are changed, and we become like Jesus. Isn't the Bible fascinating? It says you can be, you're going to become like Jesus. Everybody grabs it, and they say they read it and they, with their little bitty milk drinking, happy-go-lucky smiles, and they say, we're all going to be like Jesus. We're all going to be like Jesus. That makes you a god. See, what we don't, we don't grasp how big this is. We're so busy trying to, to smash everything down, like I've said earlier, you know, into, a, into a, what we're comfortable with. Instead of using our imagination, our sanctified imagination, going back and looking at the Scripture and going, wait a minute. How does a minor God that's being judged in Psalms 82 die like a man? It, it doesn't. It's an eternal being. There's only way that you know. Oh, but it's appointed to men to you know to live once and and to die and then go to judgment, right? But that that doesn't talk about the spirit being that gets out of the car later, yeah. which you know body and soul is cast into hell for all of eternity. You know if if, if we're living in willful sin. But the point the point I'm making is all these possibilities are spoken of in the scripture, and they introduce awesome mysteries that touch that they don't solve world hunger and in, in knowledge or anything but they touch upon awesome possibilities of what is earth here for what is god using earth for why are we going through all these things when people and, and i'll close with this point and let you finish the last 15 minutes of course but you know think about this people will often ask people who are christians they'll say and we're, we're commanded by the way to defend the faith but we do a lousy job of it and um uh and and and, and they'll say things like well why would god you know, if God is a loving God, if, you know, this, and if this, if this, if this is this, why would... The problem with you know, evil in the world. Well, and, and people will just say, well, it's the devil. But but wait a minute, God's in control. He's sovereign. He's in control of the devil. Job 1 proves that. Job chapter 1. So we know that God's ultimately in control of the devil, and that he keeps him in a sandbox. So he's ultimately in minute control. We know that Jesus said that not one sparrow falls to the ground outside of the Father's will. We know that. All right, so we know that God is sovereign, he's in control, and he's in control of the devil, and he keeps him in a sandbox. Now, that being said, they have a point. Why would God allow all this stuff to happen? And the only answer is that the whole world, all of us in our fallen state, regardless of what our origin was, which I have my theories, you probably have yours, but we're going through a test. And this test is do or die. Say that again. We're going through a test. Mankind you know that. is going through a test. God is filtering out those who he's going to raise up to be, uh, you know, to roll and reign over all of creation. Well, if all of creation includes all of those universes and trillions of civilizations of beings, then guess who we're going to be ruling and reigning over? With Jesus we're, at, at, at home. We're going, to be, we're, we're going to be a little greater than the angels. And yeah. I think there's a scripture that says we'll even rule over them. But, you know, Amen. One, one thing, first off, like we said earlier in the program, everything was perfect in the garden for millions of years. Millions. Their people weren't sick. They didn't have addictions. They didn't murder each other. They didn't have mental illness. They were dynamically and wonderfully healthy. They were helpful to each other. It was perfect with a capital P. 
everything that we know now is post-garden, right out of the chute. The first two boys, one of them kills the other. We, we made the choice. We made, Adam made the choice for us. He, the, he was the prize. He was the one Satan was waiting for. And I talked about this at length in the, in the book. And uh, he talks, we talk about the fact that all of the stuff, I was just watching the earthquake in the school that destroyed, was destroyed in Mexico, okay? And the horrors following the hurricanes, Irma and now Maria, you know, wiping out Puerto Rico. There's no, you know, we can't talk to those people right now tonight. And the thing is, is that we made a choice. We had it absolutely perfect and said, you know what? We're going to do it our own way now. What's interesting about that is that God didn't say, okay, good luck. See ya. Nice to know you. You know, we created this sewer. We, we, we wallow in it. We swim in it. We breathe it. And God jumped into the sewer with us. He, you know, we we created this awful, horrifying, wretched mess. And in order to save us, God climbed in. And that's the gospel story in a nutshell. He said, you know, I, I will take on your sins. And, uh, I mean, the story of, of uh, Abraham and Isaac going up to uh, Mount Moriah. And uh, people who don't know the Bible say that's a horrible story because, you know, Abraham's about to sacrifice his only son. He's a, 130 years old and Isaac's 30. If Isaac wanted to, he could keep his father from hurting him. I mean, his dad's 130 and he's 30 years old. You know, no 30-year-old has to lay his father shove a knife into his heart. But he laid down in obedience, and Adam, you know, Abraham made some mistakes, but he trusted God. God had told him that from your children will be a nation. He trusted him so much that he, he was going to sacrifice him in obedience to God, and God stopped him. But that was a type and shadow. And, and, and Isaac said, where is the ram, where is the sheep or the goat for the sacrifice? And, and Abraham said, God will provide, God himself will provide a sacrifice. In the Hebrew, it can be God himself will provide the sacrifice. In other words, instead of God providing the goat, God will provide himself as the sacrifice. You know, and here we are, 2,000 years from Jesus in the same mountain, God is the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. On that Mount Moriah became Mount Calvary. And God did. God was the sacrifice. Abraham had predicted. There's a little prophecy right there. And so, you know, my book, sensational title, but, you know, the purpose of the book is for me to share my wonder and excitement of God's word. So we can marvel at what God's done and he's doing and will do in the future. So I can share my view of end times prophecy. But you know what? I want people, as they read this book, to come to understand the Bible message and realize where we're at in the story and come to a saving knowledge of Christ a sensational title. There's a purpose. People to know God. Know God. You know, one of my favorite psalms, you know, my favorite psalm. A lot of, if you ask people, what, what, okay, John, what's your favorite psalm? Me? John, what is your favorite psalm? Uh, yeah, what's your favorite psalm? And don't tell me the 23rd psalm. Actually, no, actually, uh, are, are you asking me what my favorite psalm is or what my favorite yeah. um, song is? Yes. Yeah. No. P S A L M. Oh gosh. Is, um, 
Oh, man, I love so many, and I have so many of them memorized. I guess Psalm, Psalm 91 is one of my favorites, but Psalm 82 is also huge on my list, too. You know, my, you my favorite psalm. Verse? Go ahead. My favorite psalm is 139. Oh, that's awesome. It says, awesome. O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. And he says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. And then verse 17, he says, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. You know, who is worried about what God is thinking? It's like you said before, we're, we're a tribe of navel gazers. We worry about ourselves by default. We care yeah. only about ourselves and our loved ones by default. And David was concerned with God's thoughts. And it just fascinates me. And that's something I, you know, I want to experience that. That's, you know, when I'm, when I'm delving into the scriptures and I'm pondering and wondering and, and searching out these golden nuggets, I'm delving into the mind of God. It's God's word. And, you know, if you're reading an author, you know, there are certain books we read over and over because we just love them. Begin to understand the mind of the author a little bit, what they're, you know, how their mind works. And that's what this book is about, Aliens, God, and the Bible. And that is, that is kind of what is happening with me when I'm pondering and speculating and wondering all within the boundaries, you know, so that we don't go, wall off into heresy. But it's, it's to say, how precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. You know, help me to grasp, comprehend you know, and, and understand these things. I, it's, it's, it's special. It's precious. It's awesome. And, and it's the works, it's the work of authors such as yourself that leads people who have expansive intellectual minds to Christ, because it's that, it's that tiny little peanut brain, uh, uh, you know, uh, cosmology of the average little C Christian out there that condemns anybody who has uh, a background in physics and mathematics straight to hell because we do a poor job defending the faith. We just wave our hands up in the air and say, no, that, that, that skeleton's not 300,000 years old. The earth isn't mi millions of years old. That could have never happened because it's not written in the Bible, and I don't see a specific verse for it. And all we're doing is we're taking all the intellectuals of the world, all the scientifically-minded people of the world, and we're writing them off. And we're saying, you know what, I'm not going to bother to defend the faith to you because I don't have the ability to expand my sanctified imagination to be as awesome as our Father God is. And it's people that do the work that you're doing, I believe, that is going to lead a lot of the intellectuals, a lot of the scientifically minded people to Jesus Christ because you see beyond the, the simplistic easy Occam's razor perspective of most of Christianity. Praise God for your work, Brother Joel. Uh, you're an awesome guy. Um, and would you, um, uh, would you uh, share with people real quick, where can they go to get more information? Uh, you know, Facebook page, website, and then close with a prayer for us tonight. We're down to four minutes. Okay. Uh, Alien God in the Bible has its own website and uh, there's, discussion there and some of the latest things in the news like what you have it's also on facebook aliens god in the bible uh on the on the website for aliens god in the bible there is a, a link for people to buy the book all around the world uh whatever country you're in there is a link for you to buy that bible online or you can call the people i suppose but it's uh it uh everybody should be able to get it and i'm working on an ebook version of it right now the uh I know some people are going to shake their head and, you know, like you said, they're, that's okay. I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with that. When you're pushing off away from the shore into these uncharted waters, it's, uh, some people are going to stay on the shore because it's safe. 
They don't want to be criticized, and I'm okay with that. Pray that uh, God's Holy Spirit has the ability to give us understanding. Uh, He made a donkey talk, made Solomon the wisest man in the world. And I pray that when people read this book, that the Spirit will anoint them so that they can they can have that it'll bring them joy and they'll grow in their faith and grow in their knowledge of God and if they don't know that there is a living God who we can be concerned about what he's thinking and have an intimate relationship with him that he's not far away but he's near brings people into that relationship it's all about relationship when you talk about God and uh and that's my prayer, that uh, I pray that the people listening to this program, the people who read the book, will grow in their faith, grow in their knowledge, and have a sense of excitement with the scriptures and, and uh, what God's unfolding before us in these times. We're in a very special time right now. They were in these times for 2,000 years, but we are the ones who are there. It's very unusual, very special. Very wonderful. Scary. Absolutely. But uh, a privilege. And, you know, some people listening to this program may they may find themselves, Satan's going to be given the power over the saints in the end times. And they may find themselves in a difficult position. And we want to pray that God strengthens them. Because there's, that's an honor to go the way, to die the way Jesus did. You know, to, to to give your life for pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for John. I thank you for his ministry. I thank you for his energy. And I pray, Lord, that everybody listening will come to an understanding of what is going on in the world and grow in their knowledge of you. And as they grow in their knowledge of you, that they're it won't be all just in the head, but that their hearts will be transformed because our goal is to be transformed into your image. And every day we want to, we never want to give up. We want to keep working and trying and, and grow and, and strengthening and helping others. And for those of you listening, if you say, well, I don't know how to do that. You know what? Ask God. I want to know. I want to grow. And start by being nice to other people. You know what? Uh, everybody's your neighbor. Everybody's your neighbor. And, you know, that was the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your might, and love your neighbor as yourself. These two commandments saying all the law and the prophets. Just love others, even when it's hard, even when people are not loving. And help us, Lord, to grow in our knowledge and faith. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, Dr. Joel Curtis Graves in the book is uh, Aliens, God in the Bible. This is this was a very stimulating, awesome, exciting, expansive uh, uh, investigation of, uh, I like how you put it, speculative theology. Very exciting. Uh, just like the scripture says, it is the glory of God to conceal of the matter and the glory of kings to search it out. And hopefully that we will all be kings someday with our king, our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise his holy name. Thank you so much, Brother Graves. Um, uh, uh, and 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 I just pray in Jesus' name that, that the Lord just blesses you and that your work just opens the eyes of so many people so that they can join us in this eternal uh, path of, of glory that is beyond our wildest dreams. Thank you, Father, and thank you for joining us tonight. God bless you. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, John. Thank you. I and praise Jesus, and we'll see you at the Friday Night Prayer Vigil, Lord willing, 7 p.m. this coming Friday night. That is, if we don't get smashed by another hurricane. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you all for joining us.
I shall lift my obedient children to the clouds, for they shall see my glory.